Well, welcome back to the show. Um, today we've got a special guest that's super talented, actually multi-talented. Multi. Multi-talented. Whoa. Super Mariah Carey fan. Yes. Oh. Super friend. Mimi forever. My friend, Maria Luz. Welcome. How are you doing? Hi. I'll let you, even though I introduce you, I'll let you introduce yourself. No, nah, what's I, left to say? You gassed it. me up hard. That's it. Are like, you a big Mariah Carey fan? She's a huge My dad, man, he's the same. So. My, your dad's the worst. <laughs> is your dad really a big Mariah Carey he, fan? He, for his, uh, my dad's birthday, he got Mariah Carey to record a video saying happy, happy birthday, birthday to him. him. My dad, oh, my, my dad like literally too. My dad, up, I swear. He, I never he see cried him cry. and I think that video is still saved. On yeah. his, As yeah. it should be forever. Yeah. Yeah, forever. My first tattoo, I was under age yeah. it, it was a Mariah Carey tattoo <laughs> no regrets oh. for her album Butterfly which was if like, you're a super fan you still have that tattoo oh of course okay. it's right. more of a pterodactyl now but like <laughs> Mariah Carey forever but I got sent an email once from her people and I legitimately cried for 45 minutes oh my god it's just like I yeah I love her so much yeah genuinely what a storyteller what a visionary what she, a businesswoman she is, yeah. she is amazing yeah I her. remember I had a phone call with her and I had to talk to her dogs yeah, so that was like five minutes. <laughs> I don't know what to say, but it's like now I have my own dog. I get it. <laughs> I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I get. I get. Oh, the, I get the love. This as well. Oh, I can't. Uh, the uh, please, I it's cannot wait. Outside. That was the one thing I fucked up. Was like I brought cannolis, but I brought zero dog treats, and that's I was right. like, you know oh. what? That's on me. That's well, my just failure. Take one of the dog treats as a first yeah, time guest. Right. <laughs> no, that guy's spoiled anyway. So yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's got this. But um, thanks so much for having me. And I have to say, I have listened and watched all of the previous episodes but having known you for a really long time i'm so proud of you for doing this show and what an amazing evolution and growth of you as a person and you in the public eye when we first met you were so shy not to say that you're not still shy but like you were so shy you would barely come out from behind the booth yeah like nobody knew what you looked like no one wanted to come from behind the booth anyway it's like (laughs) It's like, you know cons That's, how they are. It's like, it's you don't want to get out. I mean, it is it is actually a real pain in the ass to do like the weird human Jenga shuffle around the side. But anyway, you didn't love chatting publicly. And like, this is public speaking is hard, even when it is amongst like your friends and your family and your homies and a comfortable environment you can craft yourself. It's still really hard is, honestly, to be vulnerable. Right. Yeah. You know, with yeah. your newfound celebrity. Yeah, yeah. Oh, relax. <laughs> oh, don't say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> you wait till you're doing signings, babe. It's going to be all over Red Rover. <laughs> so, so it is. But yeah, I'm so proud of you. Like this is just, it's such a huge moment and it's really hard to do shit that scares you. And it's really hard to make yourself accessible as well. I think I'm like always constantly like struggling with that. The dream is to be I would a recluse. Never, I would never <laughs> like actually picture that of you. I, f- I always thought you're like, you're like outgoing. You want to do more yeah, things. Like, that, that, that's, that's what that's, I thought as well. What, when it's I like, met you. Uh, you, look and like you, have, you look like you have no fear, but it's like when I talk to you, it's like, I'm scared. Shitless. I am. <laughs> it's, that's, I think that's good though. I think yeah, you, it's good, important yeah. to do things that scare you, but also, I kind of think of it as uh, like I have to be a professional extrovert and a personal introvert. Yeah. And I get drained by people and having to do public stuff all the time, which isn't all the time, I should say. But it has been like for sure like a conscious shift in my work is, uh, you know, the dream is to be a recluse and like never have to post a picture of my face on Instagram. Or, like yeah. never have to be face presenting to sell my work and like let the work speak for itself. I'm not there yet, so. Fingers <laughs> crossed it gets there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's always, like, I, I, I always found that the case, that's awesome to become that, mm. not to start off as that. Because that, that was the yeah. issue with me. I started off as that. And that, that place was kind of like, it kept getting darker. Mm. You got so popular, but it kind of created a shift as in, like, you can't level up to a certain point without, actually showing yourself mm. but you can hide away like we're not all banksy banksy's like he, no he, but <laughs> i also think there's something specifically about you and your work and how you think and how kind you are how kind you all are Appreciate that it. well i mean it's just like it's just hashtag facts at this point but that like you when you talk about your journey and your craft but also how you move through the world and the things that you value that's really 
it's useful for people. Like people like to engage in that. And there's so much toxicity and negativity and in the world, but like especially online and so many Honestly, yeah, so yeah. many arseholes <laughs> who are so successful. So, and so when you get a real sweetie. Yeah. And Picture being in all the fandoms. So I have to deal with all the fandoms. <laughs> and it's crazy. You're doing Marvel stuff now. So yeah. you know the fandom. So, I know. I'm yeah. terrified. No, no, no. Um, I Well, look, the Marvel thing was really interesting because I have been a big fan of this character Mockingbird for a really long time. Actually, I'm a big fan of pretty much all Marvel characters, really, in DC Comics. So it was like my first friends. I moved over from New Zealand. This is going to sound really sad. Moved over from New Zealand and uh, had, you know, like a fucked accent, no friends. And my granddad would pick me up after school. And he would dink me on his bike. You know what? Do you know what dinking yeah, yeah. is? We well, yeah. do know. Yeah. So, okay. Cool. You sure you know? You don't, right? No, I do. Uh, okay. The, 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 I'm not going to explain. <laughs> it. I'm just going to. I think I do. Know. Is it not well, a bell? Well, well dink. No, nah, like oh. not bell. <laughs> why would he? Why would he bell her? Then I don't he'd know. He'd go ding ding, and then he'd <laughs> fuck off. No, um, he would like. I would ride on his handlebars basically, yeah. and he would ride the bike. It's either, oh, it's okay. either on the handlebars or they got their pegs at yeah. the back of the. And, yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, kind of yeah, like yeah. ET. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll dink you later and you'll understand. <laughs> we'll get Cody to go for a loop around the block. Anyway, he picked me up from school. Um, I'd jump on the handlebars and he'd ride me to the library and we'd stay there until it closed. And this local library, for whatever reason, had an amazing graphic novel section, like an amazing comic section. I remember going in there for the first time and it was Birds of Prey. And I was like, oh, my fucking God. It was three women on the cover and like one of them's disabled and Helena Bertinellini. It's like different versions of that. But in this particular one, she was drawn as a, as a woman of color. And I was like, oh, my God, three women, one's disabled, one's a woman of color, like on the cover sharing it clearly lead characters and then next to it was uh a night alone which was the cassie kane um batgirl run and then there was one more i'm trying to remember what it was i think it was a batman book but i was just like oh my god this is the coolest stuff i've ever seen i was way too young probably to be reading those but i was just like straight in and then the x-men animated series hit kind of around the same time and those were my first friends were characters and Marvel and DC yeah. Comics in particular, and then monsters. I always loved monster movies and things. And so the dream for me was always to hopefully get to write for DC and Marvel in some capacity. And yeah, so now I have this book that comes out in June called Mockingbird Strike Out, which is a novel for Marvel. And it follows Bobby Morse um, post-divorce on an adventure uh, trying to solve a mystery. It's basically, I would describe it as... Out of Sight, a movie you haven't seen, meets Mr. and Mrs. Smith, a movie you haven't seen. I have seen that. Okay, there we go. I have seen that. That's all right. I've seen that one. Yeah, you know, like spy versus spy shenanigans and like a mystery and a romance and, you know, lots of MacGuffins and stuff like that. But it had always been a dream to get to do that. And, you know, it's finally there. You're there. You got it. You get it. Yeah, but to get there, I had to fuck up. Well, not fuck up first, but to get there, I had to like watch one dream implode and like we so were you learn from your failures it's yes yeah so i had um i had auditioned for this project at dc mm. for like two to three years um and finally got through and i was like oh my god i can't believe it this is huge sign this deal and i had pitched on all these other characters i had pitches really huntress is one of my favorite characters i pitched what i thought was a really sick like um teen huntress story that was kind of like the sopranos meets gossip girl i still really think that could work like uh, you know like she's running the school underground um underground racket but anyway i had pitched on all these different characters and they're like actually what we want you to do is come up with an original character I was like, fuck, if that was easy to do, that would have been the first thing I did. I think I had like seven novels at that time. I would be yeah. like, I would have skipped all the other shit and gone yeah. straight to that. Like coming up with an original character is really hard. It is, yeah. So hard. So anyway, because especially now it's sort of like we're past the gold and silver and bronze age and into this current age and it feels like there are so many great superheroes and great ones being invented every day and like everybody has done everything. Mm. Anyway. I was like, no, I can't do this. This is a dream. You can't fumble the bag, blah, blah, blah. So I came up with this character um, and I can't like talk about the specifics of it because I sound, like, you know, they NDA, take, NDA, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a full NDA, yeah. but it's just like, you know, semi keep your mouth shut. So I came up with this character that was based on an experience that I had gone through and it was sort of this whole idea of creating this teen girl superhero 
where your perceived weaknesses are the thing that makes your strength, right? Very like core superhero based stuff, but also the real science behind this character's superpowers being something that you could explain in an elevator pitch. Mm. Like yeah. all your great heroes, you're a Spider-Man, kid gets bitten by a fucking spider and they get spider, spider abilities. Yeah, yeah. Easy to explain, Hulk, gamma rays, like we're off to the races. Um, and so anyway, came up with this character, it got approved, we start designing it, how that's going to look. I write the script. Um, they also like in introduced Lois Lane into the story. They wanted to make it a female mentorship story. And I was just like, fuck, like, you know, I'm yeah. a former journalist. Lois Lane is the world yeah. to me. So it gets scripted, it gets approved, it's off, the artist is hired. And then DC slash Warner Brothers merges or gets bought out by what was then AT&T. Mm. Um, and the editor I was mainly working with leaves and the whole line gets cut. Um, not just my book, like yeah. so many other people's see, books. See, see, you got to take that as it is. It's like, it wasn't really your fault. Yeah, that's it, true. It, 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 it imploded on yeah. itself. Like yeah. I, I had like a lot of things going with DC at that time. As yeah. Well that just didn't happen anymore. And it's so fascinating because now um, post discovery, so the AT&T merger falls apart yeah. the book's back on yeah. and then the discovery merger happens the book's back off and you're like ah, uh, ah uh, yeah. uh. there's this weird thing but now that um you know everything that's happened with batgirl and all the other projects and henry cavill and superman and stuff like that there's a very visible public example that people who aren't in the geek culture co community you can you try to explain this story to someone and they're like my god why would you ever keep working in this business yeah. and it's like well you have a wee cry and you either quit or you pick up your tits True. and you keep going. True. What people don't understand though, like from week to week, the business changes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like they change people, they change bosses, they change reps who you're working with. Mm -hmm. They change like rules. It's like everything oh changes. God. Like me working with Warner Brothers from five years ago is not the same Warner Brothers now. No, yeah. absolutely not. But you know, what's so fascinating too is it's like the things that you've learned from that like I had access to the DC archives and just sort of like learned how to really work within a major two sort of comic book system, right? How to really refine those scripts. A comic book script is not, it's like a television or a film script, right? They're different. And the way you construct the story is different. And the way you're working with the artist is different. Sometimes certain artists want, you know, every panel really intricately described and others, they're like, yeah, let's just go vibes, you know, give yeah. me the dialogue and then I'll just they're all different, interpret yeah. it. Right. So understanding how to work in a team, which I love because usually writing books is so lonely. Like It's a really lonely process. It's all on you. So if you fuck up, you wear it, which is yeah. fair. But working in a comic book environment is much closer to film and television where it's like you're working with other people who are experts in their field and that really helps. But I learned how to wrangle IP, access archives, work within a system that has a lot of high pressure and stakeholders. And also I got fully paid out, like paid real, like it's the best I've ever been paid in my life. They own the character forever. So my hope is that one day that they start digging through their archives of things that they own or, yeah. you know, they're trying to do a new property or yeah. whatever. They bought that character in perpetuity. So they yeah. own her forever. So Fingers maybe, yeah, yeah, exactly. They just have the closet, the yeah. but doing the Marvel thing was really fascinating because all the lessons I learned on the DC stuff meant that by the time I got to do it for the Marvel novel, I felt like I was better yeah, at doing those it's things. Learning process. Yeah. Cause it's like a character like Mockingbird has, yeah. 50 plus years of history that yeah. you're trying to balance yeah. and um that you're trying to like serve that and serve the original fan base while at the same time hopefully not rehashing things they've already experienced yeah. and do something new for the audience and take it somewhere modern or tap into something you feel hasn't necessarily been tapped into that character for me like mockingbird sort of always been defined by her proximity to men and, you know, she's probably like, if you had to describe her in a sentence, most people would say, oh, it's Hawkeye's wife or ex-wife. And I'm like, there are so many more things to that character, yeah, you know, yeah. she's an Olympian and she's got PhDs and she's a super spy. And like, it's just. Well, they 
like you got a novel coming out, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, she explains all this like by her novel. <laughs> by her novel. Yeah, so. It's available for pre-order now. There you go. <laughs> Everyone pre-order it now. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is it um like when's it gonna be released? Roughly in June. Was yeah. It? So it comes out in June, oh, and that's when Street Fighter comes out. Oh, oh no! no. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta read it while playing on the we'll, stick. We'll read it first. We'll read it first. <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna be really tough for you. You're like, oh no, do I like bend to the front? Friendship, or do I bend to my true love street fighter? Um, but the cover has just been um, released. So it's, by the time this comes they're out, they're like the two minute out. matches. Between street the, fighter. Between the matches, I'll just show them. Yeah, so, yeah. So. <laughs> but yeah, the, yeah, so they this amazing artist called Anna Astrid um, did the cover for it. And the bulk of the story is set in Oxford in the UK. And the cover is amazing because she has uses one of the iconic buildings in that city, Radcliffe Camera, Radcam for short and has Bobby Moore sort of like positioned in her traditional fighting suit um, in the middle of Rad Cam and then has all the like the shield insignia like wrapped into the ceiling. We're going to post it right here. It's yeah, have it up fucking It's going to be right here. I feel so like unshameless about being like this cover's amazing because I had nothing to do with it. They're like, here's what we were thinking. And I was like, zero notes. This is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, congratulations on getting yeah, that. That is amazing. Thanks. So I'll just, I'll give it a cup. Maybe you really deserve it. Like I'm excited for it. Oh, thanks. Genuinely. Maybe wait Let's until see. you guys read it. Because what if it's like this is the book that they're like, that's it. No more Marvel novels. <laughs> no, we believe in you. We believe in you. Uh, just going going back we're, up. We're, we're comic book collectors though, and we like covers and stuff. So uh, just from the cover, we like it. So yeah. you win. You win. <laughs> so, yeah. So. I, was just, I was just gonna say going back to talking about you having a dream uh, and it falling off. Was the dream? working on working with dc mm. was that the dream or what was it specifically and what did appeal to you it was dc and marvel because they both have such deep banks of characters there was like the the history of comics is so like so it's like one of the true american inventions right and it's like late 1800s into early like 1900s but it doesn't really get going until this guy the phantom who yeah. like predates Batman and the Phantom was so popular that Batman was created to be like an imitator of the Phantom. And then Batman ends up taking off. And now the people who remember the Phantom are like India, Sweden, Australia, New Zealand, yeah. Papua New Guinea. Yeah. Like it's got a very niche Phantom, but because those guys started early and first, they have such a deep bank of characters that I wanted to play with. And I just always, it's really hard making up your own shit like i don't know if people know this it's really hard working in the arts but yeah. for my novels it's like i don't just create the characters i create their backstories their personalities their ages their ethnicities their sexualities the world that they fit in yes they're inspired by like real mythological monsters or whatever but you have to build everything from scratch whereas dc and marvel part of the fun is it's like the world's best toy box yeah and like wanting to get your grubby little hands in and like play with somebody yeah. else's toys. And it's yeah. not only that, it's like, um, I'm sure you grew up with them as well. It's like yeah. growing yeah. up with something. It's like, that's what I felt. It's like, I, I grew up with these things. It's like to be working on them or working with Wild. them. It's just, it's, it's not the money thing. It's not, it's just feels like you connected to something when you were younger. That's what I feel every time I work for Marvel or DC. Oh, anytime it, it just like getting to pay my rent making shit up for a living yeah. that sounds so stupid but yeah. there was an episode uh i think it was the second and last one actually um that you guys did where you're talking about what was the moment that you knew you'd made it and i was like oh that's such a good question because i think that's very that's really variable depending mm -hmm. and i was thinking about it and i was like you know what probably the time when i didn't have to live in a share house anymore i could move into my apartment with dennis the ghost yeah. <laughs> and like live in a place on shout my out own yeah, shout, shout, out out dennis. shout out dennis shout out dennis like he's a real one <laughs> my ride will literally die um but you know it's a shitty apartment it's like a one bedroom apartment but god damn i love it and it's yeah. my place and it's like i pay my own rent i pay everything i had like there is no if i fail there is no backup plan yeah, there and there is like nobody else that can help me so that was sort of like that would felt like a made up moment to me but then also like so stupid last week i bought a mac like a new mac and i was like 
who am I? <laughs> it's just like a fucking air, right? Like one of the cheapest ones you can buy. But number one, I love them because they're so portable and great to yeah. travel with. But um, this is not an ad. This, this is, not, is not, no, no, hashtag no free ads. <laughs> but free ad. if they were interested in supporting someone who's written many a book on them in many a film, then shout out. She's the ad. Yeah. She's the ad. <laughs> I literally, my previous, my previous laptop, the H key had stopped working like a long time ago, but I just oh, couldn't man. afford to get a new one. And so were you just writing novels about the, the letter H? Yeah, because it would pick it up and spell check anyway. Okay. So, <laughs> but like not just novels, emails, like imagine how much shit you have to send <laughs> from a computer per day. And then I had read this thing on the Apple website where it's like, if you bring in your old Macs, like we'll give you a discount. I was like, oh, fuck yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Like I'll bring in the old ones that I had, yeah. which were so heavy. It was like the fucking book of the dead from Brendan Fraser's The Mummy. Like yeah. I was like full on lugging it in. Yeah. And the poor like fetus who was serving me, his name was Dylan. He was very nice, but my God, he was like maybe 14. Um, I like pull out the laptop and he's like, oh yeah, no, it was like, this is from 2008. Like we don't do trade-ins oh, for these wow. anymore. I was like, damn it. But anyway, that felt like a make it moment. I was just like, I was able to buy myself a new laptop yeah. and importantly, spiritually set it up all by myself. Took me till two in the morning, but I was like, oh yeah, I crushed it. <laughs> good on you. That's an, actually an awesome story though. Yeah. <laughs> it is actually, yeah. We things, but you know. And having, having it's little wins. They're, they're good. Yeah, honestly. Best things. Little wins, and having yeah. nothing to fall back on kind of motivates you to work harder as well yeah Somewhat, yeah there was a thing um there was this meme that i saw a few months ago where somebody's like wow you're so resilient and the response was i didn't know there was any other choice yeah, and that's kind of how it it's is. always it's felt because yeah. i i finished high school i was 16 and i started work at the newspaper two yeah. days later yeah and i was covering general news and crime and so, you know, the first murder I ever covered, I was 17. Yeah. You know, first dead bodies I ever saw at a crime scene, I was, you know, 17 Oof, years old. Yeah. And that's just the job. Like, yeah. it is what it is. But journalism, especially back in the 2000s, well, especially like journalism as a job now is yeah. dying and it's so different. But this was for a newspaper, a daily yeah. newspaper. Um, so it's very like traditional journalism type thing. But it was considered a trade. You know, we got paid 11 bucks an hour, yeah. which felt like so much money at the time, but is less than a checkout check yeah. at Woolies. You yeah. know, like it was like no money and very stressful job. And it was just this thing where it's just like, holy shit, not what have I got myself into, but like, can I do this? Yeah. And I was good at the police beat, but mainly because I have always had like an interest in that. And, um, it's just a, a matter of like getting into the rhythm of things and quote unquote being resilient, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. But I didn't enjoy it. I didn't really enjoy writing about crime. I didn't really enjoy having to deal with the cops all the time. Yeah. And what I loved was film, but I just didn't come from a very creative family. Like they were all like practical sports people and stuff like that. Yeah. So not in the arts. And so I didn't, it sounds so dumb, but I didn't even, like I'd covered more murders than I had before I realized that requires somebody to make films yeah. <laughs> like that is okay, a yeah. thing like yeah. there is a people who make movies and tv shows yeah. and so i had transitioned i had like had to basically lobby my editor for months and months and months to get out of the police beat and get on to writing about film and entertainment which was what i was really passionate about and was just so excited to talk to people about what they made i still think that's like one of my favorite things yeah. like it's an old journalism thing you can't yeah. get rid of is you have to learn how to trick people into finding stuff interesting that they wouldn't otherwise find yeah. interesting. So it's like one day it's an armed robbery and that's kind of easy to make interesting because, yeah. you know, people find that exciting. The next day it's like, okay, so you're covering a schnauzer picnic and you're like, fuck, yeah. how am I going to make this compelling? Yeah, and, tough as well, yeah. 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 And so you've got to find the angle or find the story. That's the skill. That's, that is that's the skill. Right. Yeah, it's the part skill. of the job. Like, yeah. Honestly, the first time I met you, I thought you were a news reporter. You were Ryan yeah. and his crew and you guys had cameras. I'm like, <laughs> wait, what's going on? Is she a news reporter? Like, she's standing in front. She must be a news reporter. <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, I'm just talking. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Good to meet you. And Ryan's like, yeah, we love your work. It's like, what news channel was that? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was for, we were working on a, a, a documentary about George Miller's Justice League uh, movie. 
And Aaron, who was one of the producers on it, had been such a huge fan of your work for a really long time. And he's like, I know this guy, Boss. And he showed it to, yeah, he showed it to Ryan Unicum and I. And he was like, what do you reckon about this guy? We gave him through the posters. And like, we talked to him about it. And I was like, yeah, sounds sick. And that, yeah, that's how we, how we first met, which is interesting because I feel like it would have happened sooner or later anyway, because we were both always on the pop culture convention yeah, circuit. Yeah. That was the first time actually meeting you guys. Then we did the, did the posters like a week or two later. You know, this is like 10 years ago, yeah, sidebar. Just- I was looking it up because I was like, oh, I'm going to, I'm very terrible with time. I'll be like, it was 1882. I'm like, no, we were well dead. Yeah. Um, so I was like, looked it up to see how long ten ago. Years. Yeah, 10 years. Yeah, it's, it's amazing Crazy. how fast time flies. Yeah, I know. And yet so- doesn't. Like that feels like a lifetime ago to me. That doesn't feel like yesterday. That feels like it feels everything like, no, that's no, happened but, but since. It feels like huge. a lifetime ago when you searched it up. Oh, for yeah. me, it, like <laughs> honestly, I was just talking to my friend the other day, Exus. He was yes. he was the guest last yes, week. Yes, I loved that episode. Yeah. I met him in 2009, and we met through mm. Street Fighter. Mm. And yeah. we we're like we're like best friends now. But it's like since 2009, and it doesn't feel like we've been friends mm. for yeah, that long. Awesome. And when we thought about it, we've been friends for like ever. So, yeah. But how nice is like I'm sure I don't know. I'm sure people do this with other interests, but particularly with geek culture. I feel like that's a really special thing about geek culture and pop yeah. culture is like that thing that you love and you find somebody else that loves it too. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, man, you know what I'm really into? The animated series Gargoyles. And they're like, oh, absolutely. Demona was that girl. And you're like, great, let's discuss. And then, yeah. you know, you build a friendship. I, 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 like I think that, with yeah. friendships, like especially like later on in your life, like when you meet people like later on, mm. it's to have something that you connect with. Mm. And that's what me and Exus have. We, yeah. we, we have Street Fighter. But yeah. We have everything. We, we have music and like comics, movies and all that mm. sort of stuff. But the core but, thing is that it's Street Fighter. And, yeah. and also the hustle. Yeah. Like listening to him talk and listening to you guys talk, it's like that <sighs> finding people who match your energy as yeah. well, yeah. you know? Like I'm a big believer in, um, <laughs> to quote Fast and Furious, I'm a big believer in hashtag family. family. Um, me <laughs> <Yeah>. familiar. <laughs> no, but seriously. Shout out Vin Diesel. Yeah, yeah shout out Vin. <laughs> um, but cultivating a family you know not everybody has the luck or the gift of being born into a blood Mm. family that a they get to stay with or b that supports and nurtures them or c that even loves them and so getting to that point where you can choose the people that you let into your circle and choose the people that become your family that's it takes a while to learn that like you're just kind of like knocking about in your teens and and your 20s you need that with the people you meet because like like exes exes comes to australia now mm. he lives in prague he comes mm. to australia once a year mm. and the fact that when he comes back we literally pick up from when we left like yeah. a, like nothing ever happened that's mm. what you need with your friend true that. that's the thing i like yeah. with all the people i know yeah because yeah. once like there's certain times where i sit in a room with a friend that i haven't seen for a while and it's yeah. like how you doing man i'm good <laughs> that's it yeah. that's it yeah yeah and it's like it's just an awkward conversation yeah and it's like you, you try to get information yeah. out of them but then it feels like you're prying it's mm-hmm. like what? I yeah. don't, they're like <laughs> they're like the type of people you don't you might not speak to them or see them in a long right. time but when you do it's like the best time ever yes yeah. honestly and also i think um having people that understand like my job is my job sure but a job is also more than my job like yeah. i don't have any other skills yeah. <laughs> but also like i writing stories if i couldn't sell those stories people wouldn't employ me yeah. to do that i would still do it like yeah. it is in my blood it's passion, it, yeah. yeah it is the thing that like gets me up in the morning and like if i'm going for a run or i'm surfing or something i'm thinking through story and i'm like i love watching other people's stories and getting like pulled into those worlds and so to be able to do that it's a weird freaking job you work weird hours you have to travel a lot yeah. it's a very strange existence and like your job <laughs> your job whole other level whole other tier but having friends who understand that and don't judge that as well i think is is really important because it's just like yeah man and it's also hard to make new friends now yeah it is. yes yeah. Yeah. yeah but that's okay yeah. like man how many years have we got left yeah, you know what exactly. i mean how many new friends yeah. do we hey, you got another skill you, you you're good at recovering it's oh. like 
<laughs> you're good at workout like I, I like just speaking of it's like i saw you had a broken arm or something oh my then, god then like four weeks or a month two months later you're like still have the cast on i'm like what how do you still oh have no. the cast? she goes i broke it again i'm like let's see you're a warrior it was fighter. fucked yeah <laughs> shout out to the maori warrior gene we just keep going but no last year 2022 was a really weird one because it was like our first for people who live in Melbourne, you know, it was our first year out of the pandemic. And we're like, let's take life out of the balls, baby. Yeah. Like, we're back. And I was like, you. And then February, like February, it was thir- February 13 or 14 because I'd just gotten off, finished work on the show that I was so proud of. Yeah. And it had been really sick. And I'd been able to go surfing in the morning with my best friend Blake every day and then go work in the writer's room for the show. And I just got back to Melbourne. And I jumped on my bike and I was going to Melbourne Pride with some friends. And I was riding down the, down the street on my bike to get errands, stacked it, no idea how, broke my elbow. And I was like, I'm sure it'll be fine. And I didn't know that I'd broken it at the time. I was just like, say la vie, I'm sure it's cool. Like, yeah. it's all good. Went out with my friends that night, got quite belligerent. And it wasn't until the next day that a friend sent me this video of me drunk and twerking, like on the corner of a float. And I was like holding my arm at like a 90 degree angle. (laughs) And I was like, oh no. And went to the doctor and they're like, yeah, it's broken. I was like, okay, cool. So I had lots of good stuff that happened personally and professionally, but the downside was I broke four bones and it was my elbow twice and two separate incidents. And then it was each of my ankles. And it was El Faco because every time that happens, it's like, it's months of recovery and I work for myself. So it's not as if you like get sick leave or anything like that. It's really hard. Recovery is expensive as well. If you, you know, go to physio and stuff like that afterwards, I came from a sports background. So I was like really familiar with the things that I needed to do anyway. So like got to skip a few steps, but the other thing was just people like, always weighing in on shit to do with your body, which I'm not unused to as a woman on the internet, but just like, I I wish I didn't have to say, oh, hey, yes, I have just, so you know, internet, I've broken another bone. But one of the ankle breaks was at a pop culture convention. So I had to leave the signing table and obviously had to put out a thing to be like, listen, I'll be back as soon as I can. I just go like quickly dart over to the hospital. And I, I just knew, I was like, here it comes. It's always going to be people like, oh, Mr. Glass. Oh, here she is. Like moths for bone marrow and shit. Oh. Like, Who the hell says this? So, Cody, go back. I'll send you the post. You go back through the comments and people oh, will be like, have hell. you had your bones checked? I was like, yes, I have my fucking bone checked. Obviously. Like go outside for once what in your miserable life. What a dumb These question. These Australians, I don't know what these know. Australians are doing. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it was annoying. It was tough, but um, it was also just like, I just kept thinking like something good has to be around the corner, <laughs> you know, but the, the ankle and elbow that I broke at the same time, that was the worst because it was... I had to be very reliant on other people, like on my friends and stuff, because like couldn't put on a bra, couldn't brush my hair, couldn't wash my hair, couldn't take stuff to the bin. Yeah, that's the worst when you break yeah. oh, a bone or something. Yeah. It was just like all these things that I don't take for granted. Like I, every step I can take physically, I'm like genuinely, it's a marvel and I'm excited. And I love, I just like exercise for me is not something that I've ever done for <laughs> it sounds bad, weight loss or even health. Yeah. It's something that I need to do for my own mentality. Like yeah. if I'm just like have a shit week and I can't get a run in or a swim in or anything, I can feel it. Yeah. Like I'm just like mentally not well. I just don't yeah. feel as good and as myself. And yeah, just not being able to do that stuff for a, a good month. And then also being on really hectic painkillers where I just was losing time and I just had to go off them pretty much not cold Turkey, but I was supposed to be on them for like a month. And I went off them after two weeks. Cause I was just like, I can't, yeah. I can't do this. See, you're strong. It's like, it took you, about, uh, if I, it took you a month to recover. Little, yeah, a little bit, a little bit less. I was out of the elbow cast more quickly. Um, but it was, yeah, the, the ankle and elbow one was pretty bad. It was also the day I was supposed to go to LA um i know yeah, it was the last thing i was gonna do is like my flight was like six no i think my flight was like six o'clock that night so it was like you know 10 or 11 in the morning i was like i'll go for a quick jog get some k's in and then ate shit so hard and then was like i don't think it's that bad you know what i'm just gonna walk home 
And like, by the time I get home, I'll see how I feel. And it was like three kilometers of the walk home. And the first K was like adrenaline. The second K, a kilometer, I was like having a wee like cry. And I was like, I'm in so much pain. And then the third kilometer, I was like, fuck, I'm going to have to cancel my flights. And it was such a ball like at that time, because you had to go through all these different checks and balances when you were leaving the country yeah. and COVID tests and yeah. all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and it was just like this big work trip, which in the end ended up working out because um, it was supposed to be a nine day work trip. It got postponed and then it ended up being like four weeks good. and we That's crossed good. over, although we didn't see each other because yes. you, you were... guys had dinner with Michael B. Jordan instead of <laughs> how, uh, I mean, who wouldn't listen, have listen, if, we, if, if we planned it earlier, I would have ditched Michael. All right. No, I, I babe. <laughs> I, I would be, I would be, have been so furious. What a liar. I'd have been so don't furious. Don't believe me. We would have abandoned the dinner. Go on. I would have banned you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. I can, that's believable. Well, I feel like very intense energy. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm in the middle of a fight now. <laughs> no, 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 no. Shouldn't have brought it up. Shouldn't have brought no, 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 it up. Relax, relax, relax. <laughs> um, yeah, but watch. Um, the, I did a podcast with Ali, which hasn't came out mm. yet. It comes out. When does it come out? The today podcast? or tomorrow. Yeah, today or tomorrow. Yeah. Um, we touched on the whole fitness things and mm. you, you came up and you breaking came up. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. So it's good that you yeah. explained. Ali's like, I can't wait you, till she sees the podcast. Oh, shit. So, I was, expl- I was explaining that you're the next guest, and he's like, "Yeah, he he loves you." It's like Mrs. She, Glass. She, she keeps she keeps she keeps injuring herself. I'm like, "Yeah," but she comes back stronger, and I'm like, "I'm glad you mentioned oh. all the injuries now." So, well, actually, it's funny because I guess, um, yeah, like we've known each other for ten years, but I people who have known me a long time would say that I am quite chronically an unlucky person. Um, as in like, I don't know if there's a brick falling from the sky, if it's going to hit anyone, it's going to hit me. Did you walk on the ladder, break a mirror, which one, what did you do? (laughs) No, but it's just, yeah, I've like, I've had a lot of in, and like I said, came from a sport background. Um, Mm. and so you're like, I've broken my jaw. I've had a perforated eardrum. Like, you know, I've had so many stitches in my face from, you know, boards hitting it and shit like that. It's just, yeah, a few broken (laughs) noses. Like this is just, it is what it is, but um, I guess the, the one of the things that I remember when when you were going through your health stuff, I really related to that and also like really emphasize, uh, emphasized, emphasized, emphasized. Oh my god, I can't even talk anymore. She had empathy. Yeah, I'm thank not going to try to say it. I was about to say, am I having a stroke? But the reason <laughs> I <laughs> connected with it was because when I was 22, I had a mini stroke, and uh, just the things that you go through and the recovery process and the way you adjust to life and the prior things you adjust your priorities to yeah. differently really change. And that can be a really hard thing. I think for people to understand, especially when you're young and you go through stuff like that, Yeah, people don't get it necessarily. And a lot of people do as well. It's like a trying to find that balance between the things that are really important to you and the things that aren't. Well, yeah. What is really important is like in life, there's when you get scars or injuries and stuff, mm. everyone says there's a story behind it and you're a storyteller. So <laughs> every single injury has a story behind it. Yeah. You can implement it into your work. I have a so scar you know, really. right here. That's the camera. I have yeah. a scar right here that I got 12 stitches for imitating David Hasselhoff and slipping and falling into a pool. I thought you, oh I thought you imitated ha- David Hasselhoff and he did something. Yeah. No, no. I, I, I would have been around. No. Right oh, okay. I thought he right hooked you. Okay. No. In the forehead, the thing. I was in French Polynesia and I like slipped, hit my head on the bottom of the pool, got 12 stitches and broke my nose. I had to go to the hospital in a bikini. And I remember the person driving us there, they were like in a convertible V-dub, which is like one of my dream cars. Like, a 1968 Beetle would be right up there for me. And the whole time I was like, oh man, this car is fucking sick. <laughs> As blood was like pissing out of my forehead, <laughs> pissing out of my nose. But oh my God. Anyway. And look at her now sitting here. Yeah. Super strong. What a warrior. De- you can definitely tell the nose has been broken a few <laughs> times, but that's contouring, babe. You can't even tell. You, okay. you honestly can't. I swear you can't. You can't right. even tell. Okay, that's Well, I, I, I'm clumsy as well. I, I stacked it at what's called, what was it, San Diego Comic Con? No, San Diego. Yeah. That, that was the best. I missed the whole step. It's like, where was it? <laughs> to be fair, though, it's chaos there. Like, there's so much stuff going on all the time. It's just. Yeah, it's very packed. Yeah. Well. If, any, if an injury is going to happen anywhere. So crowded in the there. worst thing at cons is like you have all this adrenaline. Yeah. And it's like you're not in pain. Then I went home and it's like my whole leg is bruised. Uh. My whole leg was just blue. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, tomorrow's going to suck. <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow's gonna, and that was day one. 
out of the five days. Oh, yeah, we did and, our best to cheer up. It's going to be okay. You're going to be fine. He's like, nah. <laughs> Let's nah. go home. Let's go. When home. you guys go, like on average, how many hours a night sleep are you getting? Do you reckon? Uh, we, do it, we, do it, we get good sleep? Well, we didn't it depends. Get good sleep. Not, you didn't. Nah, on the whole trip, you definitely didn't. You nah, had a didn't. lot of work. Are you talking so. about the Vegas one? Yeah. Yeah, I probably slept like eight hours the whole four months. Jeez. No, but it's like they cut, like, they took advantage of me being there so yeah. I can get more work done. Yeah. I, I done around maybe between 20 and 30 covers, mm. marble covers mm. within four months. So literally I probably got three, four hours sleep a night. Yeah. So that, that was pretty not good. good yeah. And well, you, you know, got cons next day. And- JLo's <laughs> mantra is like under three hours or more than eight. So you're really just like JLo. <laughs> I, be- I believe she sleeps. Yeah. Uh, like she probably You're say- B-Lo. <laughs> B-Lo. <laughs> oh uh, she- Speaking of J-Lo, have you watched her latest movie at all? No. Which one? Shotgun, Shotgun, Shotgun Wedding. Shotgun Wedding. No, I haven't, but I'm really interested in this one that I think is called Mother or something, where she's like a vengeful mum assassin. That's uh, more my no, that's shit. That's new. That's new. Yeah, 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 Netflix. Yeah. I think yeah. it's like March 8 or something yeah. like that. That's right in my back. She has so many wedding movies. I know. Yeah. Like she's a bride in everything. Yeah. Is she married? Yeah, she's yeah. married to Ben Affleck, babe. Ben Affleck. Oh, yeah, Come yeah. on, she's Mrs. Dunkin' yeah, yeah, Donuts. True, what are we doing? Yeah, <laughs> I, I saw him in the Grammy. He didn't look happy. No, I don't. like. I don't think it is that, but I, I think it was just a bad, like. But it's also just, like, not his scene. You know, yeah. don't you? Like, he doesn't have to go, man. You don't have to go. Yeah. Just, yeah. you're a fucking 40 something guy, divorced dad from Boston. Like, the Grammys aren't for you. You do not have to go. Oh, so funny. But, um, yeah, I, I like, I, lo- I love Hustlers and Out of Sight, would be two of my favorite JLo movies. But in her rom com bag, I love Made in Manhattan. That's the one. Love it. You, I, I didn't think for a second. <laughs> To be clear, <laughs> I was like, "This you have definitely not seen." But I, yeah, I, it's a meme been. at this point. Oh, I'm, try, I'm trying to think of her. Her all her movies are like a multiverse; mm. like they're all connected. And she's been divorced like 50 times in her in universe, the movies, in yeah, her maybe. universe. Maybe like she loves J Lo. Loves love. That's one of the things that people famously know about her. I was like, "Good for her. Get out there." You know, takes well, a lot. Why isn't there any sequels to these marriage movies? If she loves love, why isn't it ever continued? Why is it always new love? Well, that's why it disenchanted, you know, how many people engaged. I saw you had a post for um, Cocaine Bear. Did you watch that? I did watch Cocaine yeah, Bear. Have, we haven't seen that yet. I So, you know, it's based on a true story. Yeah, mm-hmm. I know that. Yeah. But, I mean, to what extent? Eat anyone. Yeah. Rest in peace, Bear. Yeah, rest, rest in peace, peace bear. bear. Yeah. The Cocaine Bear didn't eat anyone. It was okay. The deaths were very gr- good. I really like some very inventive, interesting Hard, uh, gory deaths, really? which I love. That's yeah. good, yeah, I like Because that, that was kind of like my one sort of criticism with Megan is that I think it needed an R rating to really get to the child's play Chucky yeah. level of yeah. like infamous doll movie, even Puppet yeah. Master, you know, those creepy little fucks. Yeah. They always had a hard Puppets R rating. Scary, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, th- I think what's good is a hard R rating or R rating. The new Evil Dead. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. All of the Evil Dead. Yeah. I don't think they've ever, even the remake one, like they've, just they've never been anything like because like, that's the brand yeah. you know what i mean we we've watched the well he hasn't yeah we've watched, watched the, the latest one the new one evil dead rise they watched it because we're me. doing some work on it um so we're seeing it i think you're gonna like it oh that's exciting uh, yeah. that's it's like, really it's, exciting it, it, it pushes the gore so, okay yeah. interesting yeah because i really yeah. liked the well i really liked the remake that's maybe a controversial pe- opinion people are really mad that they ever remade it but i thought it did a quite clever job of you know, existing within a pop cultural space where everybody knows Evil Dead and it was yeah. such a historic, important film, you know, banned in countries. And Edgar Wright always tells that story about doing his own cut of Evil Dead, which had all the like extra gory scenes in it and stuff. But. Well, if you like that new take, the new one, then yeah. you, you will like this one. That's coming. Okay, cool. Yeah. I mean, horror is my favorite genre. So yeah. I pretty much watch everything that comes out. What's it's your favorite my, horror movie? My fa- Well, my favorite horror movie and my favorite movie of all time are the same thing. It's Alien. Alien. Yeah, Alien. He's never my watched favorite. it. Have you never? <laughs> I'm actually. Right, are we talking about best movie or the movie that scared you the most? Oh, movie that scared me the most. That's a different conversation. Okay. I feel like the movie that scared me the most was 1992's Candyman. 
Okay. Now, obviously, I didn't see it at the time because I'd have been like three. <laughs> mm. But I remember being old enough to watch it and like getting it out on VHS tape from, you know, the video shop and being so scared that I would only watch it in like 10 minute increments during the day. Yeah. Like I just could not get the courage up to watch the whole thing Oof. until I was in my 20s. And it was still fucking terrifying. Like truly one of the great horror movies of all time. And I will say Nia DaCosta's, um, I think it was 2021 Candyman that she did was amazing as well. That had um, Yahya abdul Medine the third in it. It was just like absolutely amazing. Really great like Lego sequel. And yeah, that, that story is terrifying. The execution's terrifying. Tony Todd's terrifying. The urban legend stuff. Like there's, ugh, I mean, you haven't seen it, but he has, I'll, this, I'll watch it, yeah, he has this thing where he has, yeah. has bees in his mouth. And he negotiated this fee where he would get an extra 20 grand for every bee that stung him. <laughs> I'm like, that's a hustle. <laughs> yeah, that is a hustle. Man. I really Jesus. respect that. But it also has this amazing score uh, by Philip Glass, which is one of the great horror movie scores. Apparently he did it not knowing that he was working on a horror movie because <laughs> he wasn't really much of a horror fan. But it's incredible. Virginia Madsen's amazing. Kazi Lemons, who is this incredible filmmaker now, but back then she was always like, the black best friend to some intrepid white lady. She plays Adelia Mapp in Silence of the Lambs, another favorite of mine. And seen it. Oh, I've heard of that one at least. Oh my God. I'm so <laughs> jealous. You have so many wonderful movie experiences yeah. ahead that's, of you. That's the only thing I like about this these guys because like, like, <laughs> it's the only thing he likes thing. about us. That's that's the only, I like about working with that, these people. <laughs> that, it's like when I want to rewatch a movie, I can get the experience of them never watching it. Oh my God. It. Yeah. So I don't think they've watched... Um, they haven't watched Jumper or Looper. So. Looper rips. Absolutely rips. I just watched Kung Fu Panda for the first time. Like two I, you have brought it up every <laughs> single episode. And I love that this is your brand. Every single what, the Kung Fu episode. Panda? Every single one. Have every I? single one. Wow. I like the movie that much. Uh, Master like, Ugwe is the goat. They would think Honestly. that we're sponsored by Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> I'm so not yeah. sponsored by but I love Master Ugwe is the guy. That's for me, it. scary movies, it's because when I was a kid, I watched The Exorcist. That, like, uh, it doesn't hold up uh, when you're older. No, yeah. I disagree. Yeah. I it think it does. No. Uh, no, no, it doesn't scare me as in like, I'm not super freaked out by mm, it anymore. Like, uh, yeah. I've grown up. But when I was younger, that, that even the commercial when they oh did the God. remake yeah. scared the shit out of me. But what gets me when I'm older is like Hereditary. That, oh. that movie messed me up. I'm like, I oh, am I your mother! <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, like the scene with the, the kid out the window, mm. like that's it. Oh, yeah. As soon as that happened, I'm like, yeah, I'm never going to be the yeah, same that again. Was a scary scene. See, I've seen her editor. Yeah, yeah, I actually, I'm proud of you for that. Thank I actually you. really respect that because people are really hesitant to kill kids in film. Yeah. And it's like, it's, you know, it's the pet cemetery effect. It's like the final, like you can't go back kind of vibe. But I will say The Exorcist when it was, I can't remember what anniversary that it was, but um. Linda Blair came out to Australia and did a screening and uh, I interviewed her for, I was working for a newspaper at a different newspaper at the time and um, interviewed her for it. And she was like very intense and interesting. And then went to the screening that night and Blake and I went and we were like, yeah, like we're horror vets. We watch everything. I mean, obviously we'd already seen it, but like buck, 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 like <laughs> this will be easy. Seeing it in a cinema with the sound, like the score of The mm. Exorcist is so important and visceral and like, so I'm excited when you guys go see Oof. Interstellar and IMAX. My yeah. first time, I can't wait, man. That Howard Shaw Oof. score slaps so hard. Yeah, it's worth waiting now, see? I get uh, to watch it in IMAX for the first time. There is a moment, which I will not spoil, but there is yeah. a moment in Interstellar, which is like my greatest fear, like, basically physicalized in a scene on a planet. Yeah. And I just remember in the theater, like feeling physically sick, watching the scene play out. And you know, Howard Shaw is just like slapping his dick down on them keys. Yeah. Like he goes so hard. Oh, the music I would imagine is oh, very yeah. good. Amazing. Yeah. I can't wait to Interstellar see it. rips. But Looper also rips. That's so I, interesting you brought love, that up. I love Looper. Yeah, Looper's oh. really, really good. I think that's really underrated for Ryan Johnson movies. Looper is one of my actual favorite movies. Uh, the whole concept of it, the, mm -hmm. the kid mm -hmm. and what, why, what his motivation Man, is. Man, they it's did like, so good yeah. finding a kid with a fucked fringe. And his, like, na his name, Rainmaker. That's yeah. Like, that's like. It's a banger. So good. That scene. I wanted the movie just on him. <laughs> like to just make a movie just like side movie, like further on, like what happens. There'd be a good prequel. Yeah. Uh, have you seen Looper? He hasn't. Okay. Yeah. There is an amazing scene 
in it where I'm not going to like get into this nitty gritty, but it's basically there's two versions of a character because it's about time travel in some capacity. It's about many other things. But anyway, a version of a character is being tortured in the present and then the character, the other version of him in the future is like losing limbs as he's being tortured. And so he's like, it's this like race against time for him to get to his older body before he loses. He's like trying to yell and he loses a tongue. Yeah, it is fucking horrifying. Oh, well, you guys want to watch it tonight? You feel like oh, watching? No, you want to watch uh, that or Jumper? No, Last of Us. Oh, last after, of after, Us. After Last. That's right. It's only a fifty-nine minute episode. Yeah, you can. Right. That's like an aperitif. Yeah. You, you mentioned Pet Cemetery before. Yeah. I remember doing like the posters for Pet Cemetery. Yeah, for the new one. For the new one, which I, I really liked. It was so funny though. It's like. One of the things I did, like I did an awesome poster, mm. and but the thing is, it showed like a zombified dead dog, right? Right, and they're like they spoilers. No, no, there's no <laughs> it's not about spoilers. They, they came back with notes saying they don't want cruelty to animals on the poster. I'm like, you I know mean, what the movie is, right? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, I don't know how to respond to this well so i have to literally take out the dog and the title is literally <laughs> pet cemetery it's like it's like we don't want to show like we could do know, a tortoise, tortoise but i don't know if that has the we same emotion we we to animals. So i'm like <laughs> the, the cat comes back to life I, I don't know what's going on here the notes for stuff like that sometimes are so weird i remember um like having a getting a list of words that I could and couldn't use um, for writing something that was in like a certain IP world. Yeah. And it was like, you couldn't say, you could say but, but you couldn't say ass. And you could have violence, but it had to be heroic violence. And you could have deaths, but it like sort of had, couldn't be really tied back to the character being I responsible. That's so weird. Yeah. It, no, it, it so, does nah, make there's, sense. There's, there's some weird shit. Yeah, yeah, I know. It does that's make sense because it's like, it's, that's their baby. Buttocks. Like, you can only say buttocks. Yeah. But I remember there was this really sick, um, I love the character of She-Hulk, and there was this really cool She-Hulk novel called The She-Hulk Diaries, which had this amazing cover, which was like bright purple. So immediately I was like, ding, ding, ding. And then it had a green lipstick, and it was this book by Marta Acosta, and it was a novelization. Oh, no, no, love his, not a novelization. So it was just like a She-Hulk novel, and it was like, her off just like living her life and like doing science and like trying to figure out her legal life and like dating. And it was like very mature book. And I was like, man, this rips, like this would be such a great adaptation. And I think maybe you had a little bit more fluidity with it because it was a novel rather than, you know, playing around with a character that people think they know really well in the space. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Kind of going back on the topic of horrors. Yeah. What's your favorite, Slim Shady? Oh, my favorite horror. I think it'd have to be the Conjuring series. Ooh. I, I'm a big fan of uh, the Warrens. Yeah. I'll yeah. Them. <laughs> uh, just uh, they were amazing to me. I don't know. I love them. The first one, I don't know. The first one, I don't know which one of the, of the three I love the most. I think one and two. Are the but I, think, yeah. Yeah. I really liked three, though. The, I liked three. I'm the idea saying, the strongest... of making it like a legal drama, I thought, yeah. was a very interesting twist. Um, I was on the set of Annabelle Comes Home, which was, no yeah, and it was really interesting. And um, James Jude, who was the amazing you know, publicist, uh, who worked, he's worked on all the Conjuring movies. They had this really cool office where he had like, uh, like crucifixes and stuff like rigged to buttons. So as he went to sit down in his office, like a crucifix would spin and shit. That's so <laughs> cool. It was really yeah. cool. I was yeah. just like, oh my God. So I got to hold, not the real, obviously the Raggedy Ann doll, but I got to hold one of the Annabelles. That's- oh Did you get a picture at least? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll oh show God. you after, I'll show oh, you after. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say on the topic of um, horrors, mm. you were able to direct your own one, a short, like a short film oh, recently. Oh, yeah. smooth transition. <laughs> I, I was like sitting on like, I want to talk about it, I want to talk about it. We got to look at it last night. As oh well. my god, yeah. I'm so nervous. He took, the spot, he took the spotlight. I was about to do it. Uh, <laughs> you suck. Um, yeah, how was that experience for you? How did you find that? I know it was your, something. That new. was your director. Yeah, like director debut. debut. First yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, I was so terrified. I may, was mainly most scared of becoming an asshole because <laughs> I think I've just I've worked with a lot of people. You get told they're so great. No, this person's so important. If you became an and, asshole from the first one, it's like that's amazing. But this yeah. is what happens, though. <laughs> like you joke, but like this is literally how it happens. Yeah. Where it's just like, oh, I don't know. I've just worked a lot of things where I've just been like, I don't know if the art is ever worth or justifies the emotional abuse that different people can put each other through. So I was like, I just really want to create safe environment on set 
where everybody feels safe and heard and like that they have the opportunity to do their best work because all film productions, it's like it is a team sport. You know what I mean? It's so rare that a movie, A, gets to be good. <laughs> a, that a movie gets to exist, period. But yeah, B, gets yeah. to be good. For it to be good, every single department needs to be like at the top of their game. Everybody yeah. delivering their absolute best. And then also all working together and with each other and working in conjunction with each other. And just because the nature of human beings, that's really hard to do. Like there are personality clashes and like there's all sorts of like stress and monetary stress and time stress and anyway, all these different things. But um, so I'd written this short story called The House That Hungers, yeah. which um, was nominated for a few awards. And I had never been very good at writing short stories. They'd always been super long. Yeah. <laughs> Henceforth, why I'm a novelist. Yeah. I was always shit at it. And yeah. I was, was like, I really want to try and get better at it. So I was trying to, you know, I was reading lots of great short stories. I think Stephen King is the best short story writer, in my opinion. Um, less cocaine in his short stories, shall we say. Like, they're really tight and, like, yeah. the concepts are great. And so I was reading lots of short stories and trying to hone it. And so I came up with this idea for the short story that was inspired by Melbourne Quarantine. And just, um, and like city lockdown and just watching like all these men get arrested for like trying to sneak out on Tinder yeah. and hinge dates. And I'm like, you are literally willing to risk your life to get your dick wet right yeah. now. Like it was yeah, just honestly, so yeah, baffling. Yeah, it yeah. Like you always talk about, you talk horror movie tropes and stuff. And it's always like a slasher is like a woman getting pursued or yeah. whatever, or like people ignore a warning and yada, yada. And I was like, we're literally in a pandemic. Yeah, and they there are get that. Yeah. people like ignoring a warning and like my life or getting laid, oh, getting yeah, laid. Yeah, yeah. And so that's kind of what the story is about is this, um, this woman gets stuck inside a house um, during a pandemic and the house uh, she's been told by her mother who's, who's just passed away that the house is haunted and the house will eventually, it hungers and she kind of thinks her mum's nuts and then weird stuff starts happening. And so she kind of has to um, enter into this negotiation, I guess, to try and stay alive within this house during a time we can't go anywhere. And so there's this Adelaide production company called We Made A Thing Studios who make a lot of short films in conjunction with the University of SA. And they reached out and I had written a short film for them about assassins a few years earlier that had played at some film festivals and um, that we're developing into a TV series for Stan. And they had reached out and said, hey, have you got anything that maybe we could make into a yeah. short film and I was like yeah. I do here's a short story and like you know let me whip together a script version and they're like would you like to direct it and I was like I don't know I honestly I was like Oof, do I want to give that a crack I've never done it before yeah yeah maybe I'll be shit but like you don't know what you don't know exactly you gotta until try you know yeah. it you have to try right and at least if I try and I'm bad or I hate the experience then at least I know, like, okay, you know, <laughs> stay yeah. in your lane Did or whatever. Did you like the experience? Loved yeah. it. Yeah, I really loved it because I love working in a team. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, and, yeah. like, the the final version of the short, I was, like, the thing that makes me so proud of it is I can really see everybody's work. Yeah. Like, I can see Pop Ellen, who was our amazing production designer, who basically like came up with, uh, was trying to do all the stunts um, and like a lot of the death scenes and stuff physically rather than digitally. And um, because the film is dedicated to Ron Cobb, who was a friend of mine and yeah. former neighbor, but he was also one of the concept artists on Alien, Star Wars. He did the Cantina yeah. Aliens from Star Wars, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but he was always obsessed with like physicality on set. And Alien, my favorite movie, has a lot of physical stunts, the key being the chestburster scene. So like getting to watch the final shot and I can see Pop's work and I can see Kate Boyle, the costume designer, and my wonderful friend, Kimi, Kimi Timagoshka, she was the lead in it, Polly. Yeah. And her performance is just unbelievable. Yeah. Like she, the whole thing, you either believe the story or you don't mm. based on her. And she has so few lines of dialogue. It's all on her face and, and what she can deliver and what she can achieve. And I was just like, oh, damn. And like the editing and, you know, one of my oldest friends, Amanda, did the score and it's her first ever film score. And, you know, we went to primary school together. We got suspended for getting into fights together. She, um, she won an aria for being the front woman of this teenage rock band, Operator Please, and yeah. has been, you know, nominated for a Scottish Music Prize. So talented. So it was, that was my favorite part of it is going to be like, you're great, you're great, you're great, you're great, you're great. 
let's all yeah, let's work all ma- together. together make a, yeah, yeah, it was super stressful though. Like, yeah, how the, long did it take? It was only a four day shoot, um, yeah. but we had two weeks of pre production. Yeah, and during that time, uh, we like Kimmy had flown into Adelaide, and then by the time she landed, she tested positive to COVID. So then she had to go into quarantine for x amount of days until she was negative so we had to readjust the schedule and that readjusting was um doing a writer's room for the normals and it was the first writer's room i'd ever run which in and of itself is a very separate and stressful thing and so it was kind of doing the two things at once but so this okay so this is the ghost story related to the house that hunger so adelaide just as a vibe pretty haunted city right Mm. pretty terrifying place stephen king once called it like the scariest place on earth. And I'm like, true. Um, it, it really is like Australia's Detroit. But anyway, while I was there, I was living above this pub. Um, and the pub had been built in like 1888. So it was old as shit. So yeah. I know it's full of ghosts yeah. and in the pub, it's just like, there's no one else staying there. It's just me. So it's just like a favor through a mate. And so there were all these rooms that were just empty and previously there had been some Irish jip rockers living up there and then the border had opened so they'd all like dashed across the border. So all of their stuff was left there, kind of like the Titanic sort of vibe, you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, they'd yeah. left mid incident yeah. yeah. and so like, oh my God, like this is really creepy. And the room I was staying in didn't have electricity. So I was like using like, t- you know, candles and shit like that. Anyway, just generally creepy vibes, creepy vibes. Um, and especially like, there was lots of times when the pub was shut. So I was just in this pub with all these rooms by myself. Yeah. The South Australian Film Corporation, their main building is an old asylum. And I mean, like, looks like Arkham Asylum, old asylum. Yeah. Like offices are converted from cells. Some of them have like fingernails down the wall. They have trouble hiring cleaners because cleaners are getting like shoved into rooms by little children dressed in Victorian clothing at two in the morning. And it's just like, you just go there and you're like, okay, you know that feeling yeah, yeah, when you're yeah. like, this feels like a bad place yeah, because- You just get that feeling. Yeah. We need to go make an episode. Your too. heart sinks. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. We become Your ghost hunters. Go ghost yeah. hunters, yeah. You could do that. That would be fun. I mean, you could do that for all of South Australia, I think. You could do the whole like <laughs> bus logic hits the road tour, ghost hunting. But um, anyway, so- We were shooting, the physical location was at this castle called Dunluci Castle, which is a recreation of this castle in Northern Ireland, which was one of the primary sets for uh, Game of Thrones, real castle. And this reverend came out from Ireland to Australia, built this mansion thing that's inspired on a wing, but inspired by a wing of this castle. And his son, apparently this house is haunted and it's because his son died in World War One. And I'm like, okay, I'm not sure how that has anything to do with the house. And then his daughter um, got eaten by a great white shark at the beach just down the road. I'm like, okay, but the shark didn't eat her in the house. So like, what does this have to do with the house? Like, you know, you're doing all the math. But anyway, that's the vibe is the house is haunted. So we were doing a recce there and just checking everything. Yep, all good. So I was there with one of the producers, the lovely Ash Knot, and um, we checked the dining room's empty. And I was like, okay, cool. Yep, it's good. All right. So we go to close the door. So we close the door. And as we close it, and like my face is where the microphone is. So the door's right here. We hear this like knock, knock, knock right against the wood, right next to her face. And we know the room's empty because we had just cleared it, right? And okay, there's no one in there. And so it was like knock, knock, knock. And Ash and I kind of look at each other and she goes, it's probably just the wind. And I was like, it's not the wind at all, but whatever. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Like, you know, I'm not going to be fooled and go investigate. Yeah. Like I've seen enough horror movies. Yeah. So we leave, blah, blah, blah. It's all good. My friend Joshi uh, comes to say, who's an amazing screenwriter, just like one of our great indigenous talents, Josh Zambano, he worked on the normals with us. And so he came to stay and was staying with me in this creepy pub. I was like, oh, thank God. There's like somebody else here. I like saged him, saged the place. Yes, I brought my sage stick with me. But anyway, we're doing the normals writer's room. And then after that finishes, uh, we're doing a costume fitting with Kimmy and Kate that's over Zoom. And so I'm sitting there in this room and Josh is with me and we're at the South Australian Film Corporation building. It's nighttime and the building is like a boardroom, but half of it's glass, like all around one yeah. side. And you can, it's all dark and you can see the trees moving. And as a sidebar, people used to hang themselves from those trees. So just like not a good vibe, not good yeah. energy. Yeah. So we're sitting there, Josh is out of frame and I'm having this Zoom conversation with them. And, um, and I would start telling them the story about the knocks on the door at Dunluce Castle. 
And what I stupidly did was as I was telling the story, I knocked three times on the wooden surface, which is like a big no-no because then you're like physically enacting an invitation. But at the time I was so caught up in telling a sick yarn yeah. that that's what I did. So I go knock, knock, knock and I'm yard. And then two seconds later, start to see these figures like coming through the dark and I could just see them getting closer and closer and they're going like this. It's like late at night and there's nothing out there, right? It's like, what the hell is this going on? And these people are dressed very strangely, like not, you know, like Jack the Ripper, but definitely not from this decade. Yeah. Like kind of. But it is Adelaide, so it could be. I mean, this is the <laughs> thing. <laughs> These are the facts, Cody bringing them hard. And so they're kind of waving at me and then they start banging on the glass. And I was like, said to Kimmy and Kate, I was like, so give me one second. And so I go out to like, to the glass, these people banging in the glass. And they're like, hi, we're here for the ghosts. And I was like, sorry, what? And they're like, we're here for the ghosts, for the ghost tour. I was like, oh, I, I, I don't know, man. This is like, this is the film building. Like, I don't know of any ghost tour here. I'm sorry. Like, where were you supposed to go for it? And they're like, we don't know. I was like, oh, okay. Well, do you have a ticket on your phone? Oh, we don't have phones. And I was like, what the fuck? And I was like, well, what time were you supposed to meet them? We don't know. Oh, and what's your name? And what do you do? And we're like asking very interested in me what I was doing. And then they see Josh and they're like, oh, and what's his name? And what does he do? And they were asking us all these questions about ourselves. And it was just like a very strange thing. And Josh was like, he, you know, bless his heart. He's just like real sweetie. And so it's just like, we're both trying to be like sweet and nice and like, oh, I'm sorry. I don't really know like where to point you in the right, right direction. And so they eventually leave and go off into the night. And I'm like, bye. <laughs> Ash, the producer, had just come back into the room because she was doing a lap of the building because on weekends – to leave the building, you, you can't swipe out until the whole building's empty. Mm. And so she was doing a lap of the building to make sure it was empty, right? She comes back in just as we're waving people off. And she's like, what is that about? And I was like, oh, I don't know, man, weird vibes, whatever. So we shut down the laptop, pack everything up and go to leave. And our swipe cards work so we know there's nobody else in the building. And there's like this courtyard that's sort of like a U shape. So this bit's empty and the building kind of wraps around like this. So we come out of this door this way and we're going through the courtyard. And as we pass this wooden door, there's bang, 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 like loud as you've ever heard it. So loud. It sounded like somebody was slamming a body against like the door. That's how loud it was. And we know there's nobody in the building because their swipe cards wouldn't have worked. Mm. And so we all just like freeze. And I just like, I jump in front of Josh and Ash and like push them back. I'm like, yeah. we're just waiting. Okay, let's get the fuck out of here. And so we all piss bolt, run back out, run around to the gate, get into the car. And Josh is, again, as I mentioned, very sweet person, very not confrontational. We get into the car and Ash is like, maybe it was a possum. And he's like, a possum with fists? What the <laughs> fuck? Let's get out of here. And so we get in the car, we go and we are so freaked out. And like I saged us both. We got back and Josh was having like dreams about hearing the knock all the whole time. Oh, poor guy. Anyway, I was talking it through with my friend Nicola, uh, Nicola Scott, an incredible artist for DC um, and the artist behind Black Magic, which is an amazing creator owned comic with Greg Rucker at Image Comics. I was talking about her with it because she's a practicing witch and she knows this shit. And she's like, you should ask the other girl, Ash, that you're with. You should ask her if she saw the people that you're waving goodbye to. And so I checked with her. I was like, did you see them? She's like, nah, I didn't see anyone. And so it was only Josh and I who saw them. Anyway, super weird experience, super weird vibes. Oof. And um, So there's two situations here. It's yeah. either like a ghost or a stranger's situation. Just, you, oh, you, of you guys haven't watched strangers either, have you? I have. I'm pretty sure I You've have. Watched I'm not mistaken. I'm pretty where sure I have. Where someone knocks on the door and they're, they're like, they're like serial killers. I'm uh, searching. I'm that movie sure scares me. That movie, that movie is legit scary. There's a line in that at the end where she's like, why you did you home. do this to us? Because you were home. Yeah. That's then like, I'm just like. So those oof. people seemed like they were out of this time. Like they were from another time. Y yeah. But like, Cody makes uh, a great uh, point. Again, yeah. it's, it's Adelaide. Adelaide. I've seen people in Adelaide dressed like this. Yeah. yeah. But have you, have you ever driven to Adelaide? or you? Yeah. No, I drove there. So we drove to Adelaide and it was like. It's a weird vibe three, in between three here in the morning, and there. And we're driving through this town where like. It kind of looks like those 
you know, abandoned houses. Oh, yeah. And literally, it was 4 a.m. and we're looking for a petrol station. We're driving slow through a street. You guys it were was, looking for a petrol were, station at 4 a.m.? Yeah, because we were at, almost out of petrol. What it, the fuck? Listen, listen. You never go we to a saw petrol a house. station we saw You guys a, make me so nervous. We saw <laughs> a house and there was an old lady sitting on the porch. We were like just... With her chair, she's just sitting oh, there. I'm like, chair? at 4 a.m. No, it wasn't oh, rocking. That, that would have been, been a full cliche. Yeah, yeah. But it was 4 a.m. What the fuck is she doing outside? Yeah. I'm like, Seriously. I'm like, let's not stop here. Just let's just keep going. And the worst thing is there was a car while we're driving there. Like the, the kilometers is 110. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. This car blacked out windows and everything. Would drive 70 Ks, right? And so we'll overtake it and we'll drive fast. And then he'll speed up like later, mm. like five minutes later mm. and go in front of us and go mm. 70 Ks again. And it's like, it's all black. When we go on the side of it, it's like, we can't see inside. It's like, this is like a bad this situation. Sketchy, yeah. I, well, you know, like when Wolf Creek, the film came out, yeah. obviously it's like inspired by many true events, but you understand that if you've driven anywhere in Australia, that's like not like Sydney to Melbourne and Sydney to Brisbane. Both of those are like pretty Sydney to Melbourne. They're, they're it's just one ten on the highway. They're the normal. Highway. It's like oh, right. Adelaide is kind of the same thing, but it's the opposite way. It's crazy. But it's, still, it's it's like legit scary. <laughs> I on so I had never done that drive. I love to drive, and so I'd never done it before. And I'm just like, I'd just rather be somewhere with in a city that I don't know that's spaced out with a car than without. And we need it to put in gear and whatever. And and like I would like the drive and so it was my first time doing that drive and I did it during the day yeah. and there were many times that I felt uncomfortable like I was choosing when I stopped to go past a few towns and they have these like, big racist signs and stuff and you're like what the was it just fuck you? just you driving? just me oh, yeah. yeah did you ever go to an old petrol station because we went to old... I went to an old ass one yeah yeah and and it's like yeah, he hello how you doing um yeah just this one and the lady wouldn't talk there wouldn't are, talk to us there's not many petrol stations between here and yeah. there like yeah. you kind of think it's gonna you'll go into like a big 24 hour bp yeah. or something but it's not like that and even the 110 on the highway and shit it's like you're dropping down to 50 and 60 through some of those small towns yeah, yeah, true. it's a weird vibe like well, the petrol been. station we ended up going to was an off-road and it was on one-way road oh, and it's like boys it's on a dirt tr <laughs> oh dirt track that should be a big <laughs> sign we enough, went there, like literally how are you alive oh, we, no. we got out of the car we we filled up petrol and the lady like wouldn't talk to us like hello how you doing goodbye anything <laughs> it's like nothing i'm like i hate this place already yeah that's yeah. hectic the other one that's interesting is adelaide to perth like it's i think that whole line is, is just effed up yeah when you talk to americans it's interesting because australia like geographically size wise is kind of the same size as america basically yeah. but we just have so few people there's just every compa comparatively there's just so few people and they're all really spread out spread on the out. coast so you get these pockets where yeah. it's just like like damn. when you talk to someone that's like and they say they're from perth it's like it's literally like oh you're from another another country so like, yeah but they also <laughs> will know other people yeah oh, do you know so and so yeah yeah i do yeah like you know yeah. anyone from perth they will know each other like yeah. for sure it's very fascinating. And then you go to Queensland and like there's pockets of Queensland where it's like everybody thinks they're a cast member in Yellowstone. Like they're all wearing T-shirts like what would Beth Dutton do and shit and like the cowboy hats and the Queensland. boots. Surface Paradise is where Then you go to Melbourne. Surface where, Paradise, real. That's where it's at. That's love, the most Melbourne boy thing you've ever I've seen. I've only been there, but I like Surface <laughs> Paradise. Cavill Ave. Woof. There's a, so I like, I quit drinking from 18 to 30. Yeah. And one of the big reasons why is because, you know, like the Gold Coast, it's a party city, but we started yeah. everything young. And it was just like those years that you would go out on Caval Ave and just, yeah, it was just bad and grotty. Also, anyway. I don't know. Something about surfers is just nice. Bro, you're like the most basic person. <laughs> <laughs> I've only been surfers. In your I've heart been of hearts, you're a blonde white girl. <laughs> and I really respect Thank and appreciate you. that appreciate about you. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, wait, so, so you guys watched... Someone designed this. Like, oh, my God, please. Oh. Wait, so you guys watched the short together? The Which one? All of us, yeah. Uh, I watched you, it by you, myself. You watched it by himself. I, I went home Shady to see my parents. It. Yeah, I wanted to ask... Are we allowed to ask questions? Yeah, about? ask away. So how did that house eat before the girl? Okay. Oh, okay. You mean like plot questions. Like, was the mum doing the same thing to people? No. The, well, so the the house... Eat, okay, so this is the, this is the thing that I don't know, like... 
maybe we beep this or maybe we don't because oh. I don't people wouldn't have seen it yet. But yeah. the just spoilers now. So if you want to stop fast yeah. forward a bit, do it. Yeah. Okay, so the house <laughs> eats the mum. At the start of the short film, the mum's dying and the house is like slowly feeding on her. Yeah. Yeah. And then the house is also there's a few scenes. It's like very the the idea is it's supposed to reward like a rewatch, right? Um, and so there's a few scenes where you move through the hallway and you see like memorial like little signs for a grandfather or a father and stuff so it's basically eaten every other member of the house up until that point but then there's also a bunch of pet graves out the front of the house yeah. and you also see a cat at one point that you don't see for the yeah. rest of the short so it's yeah. eating each of the members of the family and then also eating any animal that's unfortunate enough to sort of cross its path and so when the mom eventually dies and Polly is having these moments where the house is sort of trying to get her, she has this incidental moment where she sort of realizes that, oh, if I can just keep the house fed, then we're good. Yeah. And the sort of idea was trying to shift a female character from being often in horror, from being prey to predator. Yeah. And just sort of like making that decision of like, how much is my life worth yeah. compared to, to other stuff? I guess, but yeah, I don't know. Well, I felt sorry for the dudes. <laughs> <laughs> you would. Yeah, I'm like, they just wanted like to date. I'm like, get criminals. If they want to go like, on a date. <laughs> some of, some of How them. easy do you think it is to get criminals over there? Yeah. She's just leaving like I'm little like you. fine yeah. china, like a trail yeah. of it to the house. Some Cancel of them look like Put they deserve it. Put in the newspaper, that, wanted criminals. <laughs> Some of them look like they deserved that. That was like a, there was like a lot of our crew. There was like it's a like, lot of the uni students yeah. and stuff who worked on it and we made fake doting profiles for them. And our production designer, Pop Allen, he's the guy who like twists his hat sideways. So who, <laughs> who's, who's, the ma- who's the main guy, the one, the creep? Oh my God. Okay, so that's Brendo. He's amazing. Um, Brendan Cooney, he is in a film called The Stranger, which is a Netflix original, really brilliant movie. Um, Joel Edgerton's in it and Jared Harris, and it's really incredible. He was also in the short film that I did, The Normals. He played um, a sort of like incompetent detective in that, and he just... He just has it. Like, I don't know how to describe it. Other as than soon that. as I saw him in the start when he's, he's like so good. asking her if she lives alone, I'm like, that guy's coming back. Yeah. He takes <laughs> yeah, direction so well. That guy's coming yeah, back. Guy's like, coming I back. had said to him, I was like, the vibe is that close talker. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, that guy who's, like, not doing anything that makes you, like – that you feel if you were like you're being creepy you feel like you're crazy but they're like they're talking too close to you and like shout out mo their shorts are like really high <laughs> shout out mo <laughs> and it's just like that that like invading your personal space like yeah. all of these like little microaggressions that happen to you as a woman all the time but especially the question of like do you live alone and and stuff like that yeah and having a lie about it like you know those are all things that you learn like i remember i lived in this place in sydney and i had to learn the hard way because i got doxxed and it was like you Oof. know there were, it's yeah. people showing up at the house and everything but like finding out my address was really easy because I had like, we had a stupid hashtag for us in the share house, hashtag angel street angels. And I was like, okay, so we're fucking very stupid. Yeah. And yeah, like there's, we're all, you know, sleeping in each other's beds with hockey sticks at this point, Oof. but just like things that you don't think about having yeah. to be careful about you have to, yeah. hiding where you live or making sure it's there's important. pictures yeah. that don't have anything like super recognizable exactly, yeah. and yeah, well, that dude, stuff like that. That dude on fucking TikTok. That just sees a tree in your house. Yeah, I know where you live. Yeah, I know. I know. I've seen. It's like that dude is like. This guy seems a grain of dirt. Yep, that's China. It's like oh, that 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 (laughs) that sign like that looks like a hundred years old, and it's just random. And he just sees the tip of it. Yeah, that's in like Egypt. This (laughs) that doesn't this street specifically. He needs to be hired by the FBI or something. Because that's like a really special skill. Also, he is the Fed. Also, I like when. The, the main character the girl she's like uh i live with my boyfriend and he goes why didn't he help and, she, and you said he's a graphic designer yeah. i'm like what does that mean what does that <laughs> shut, mean shut, what, shut. what does that mean no i was specifically trying to find a job graphic designers can't lift <laughs> <laughs> that's what she's trying to say. i was trying to find a job that somebody of that generation and that profession would look down upon so it's anything that's not considered physical you couldn't say influencer 
That would have just nah, done it. <laughs> nah. I don't think they would know what it is. A YouTuber. Yeah, TikToker. He's a, he, yeah, exactly. He's a TikToker. He's a t- he's, he he does TikTok dances. Mad savage Meg the Stallion dance, like you wouldn't believe. But <laughs> but yeah, the aim is um hopefully it gets into a few film festivals and make it happen. Like yeah, movie. you specifically, yeah, yeah, whoever yeah, you are. Hey, that you. was so aggressive. Yeah, I thought it was specific. I'm into the film festival. Make it happen. I'm into the, the, film, it festival. the film festivals, bro. Do it's it. Not, it's not the crowd. Yeah, you specifically, Mr. Nah. Sundance or whoever. Hopefully it makes it. Hopefully. Yeah, and the idea is hopefully people senior, see it. And senior then. Sundance. Senior <laughs> Sundance. I was going to say, personally, I love the whole concept uh, of the short film. And we were discussing it after we had watched it. I personally like. If it were to be extended into a mm. full film, I feel like it'd be like really good. I love so it. I'm so glad you said so, that because we have a feature a... script and oh. a whole proposal. There you so. go. Yeah, because it needs Hopefully. like I wanted it to be a full film because yeah. I yeah. need to know more backstories. Exactly. Yeah, this exactly. is yeah. yeah because it's the house that feeds, I, sh, the mother didn't build the house obviously, Mm-mm. so it's an old house. Yeah. yeah. So what happens to the gener like who's the generations and where's the origins of this yeah. house? What was? Yeah. Well, the idea... Oh, I don't know if I want to spoil this. No, cause... don't spoil it. Just okay. like, do you have the ideas. Yes, this yes. Is, this is like, we'll, we'll wait till she gets accepted. Yeah. Green lit. Well, it's movie. a little bit yeah. like yeah. The Shining. You know how the Overlook Hotel is in the story? It's buried on a Native American yeah, yeah. burial ground. There's this amazing um, documentary called Dark Days Beyond, uh, which is about the history of folk horror. And there's a really incredible Native American filmmaker in that who's like talks about that plot point and he's like this whole country is a native american burial ground i'm like oh that's such a good point but um that was supposed to be the basis for why that particular hotel is haunted so there's something tied to history and tied to the physical construction of that house um and why it is built the way that it is built and that is weirdly like all based in real fact and history it's like the construction of all of those castles from that era and all different parts of the world they were built certain ways and like wings of certain pointed in certain directions astronomically that you're like how does that how could you know how does that work that's yeah. beyond me i can't build shit so it really is literally beyond me but is really fascinating and yeah anyway so that's kind of the idea but that's sort of the intent with or for me anyway number one see if i could do it number two yeah. see if i enjoyed the experience and felt like um everybody got to do their best work and yeah. work together and then Hopefully somebody sees the short and they're like, damn, yes. I can see a future it sounds, pathway. It sounds like Blumhouse needs to look at it. Yeah. That's what, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, Blumhouse is the per- would be the perfect home for it, hypothetically, yeah. because all of their features, they, well, firstly, they give like first time filmmakers a chance. Like yeah. they work with people who have, uh, don't have shit loads of experience all the time. If your vision is really clear and concise and you know what you're trying to do, but they're also willing to take a risk on people because their budgets are so low. Yeah. So the risk is actually quite small. They say that the average Blumhouse budget is between 700 grand and 10 mil, 10 mm. mil obviously being the higher end of the spectrum, but you could do a house of hunger's feature for like 1.5, 30 days or 1.5 you could get done. Um, but that's, you know, any of those, a lot of those horror films are very clever because they are like one location. And so trying to find out, find ways to like keep the budget down i don't know i don't know what the budget was for invisible man ah oh, i was on the set for that yeah what was that was, so i don't think that had too much of a budget i think that and that came out Chris. yeah like, i think that i think that was about seven or eight seven or eight yeah yeah really? i thought it was like uh maybe because yeah they did do a lot of cg yeah, yeah no there's yeah. oh man yeah. Yeah. like the she actual effects yeah, yeah 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 how much was it it was around seven million how US quick he was with her man yeah. love that yeah. um well, she said it will fail yeah, she got it, I know. yes <laughs> but uh, i was cheating because i was there so i did ask that question but um yeah so they had like the the interior of the house was a build on the sound stage at fox or previously fox studios now disney marvel studios and in sydney and a few exteriors because it was set in San Fran from memory, but it was like filmed oh, that's, in that's Sydney. That's the price, though. That means they rented that that glorious house. That well, that's here, that though. Was, that's a yeah. That was here. Yeah, that's on the central coast. I thought that was in America. No, you can stay in that house for fifteen bucks. Um, fifteen bucks. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, could you imagine? I would have gone and stayed there. For it's on Airbnb. You can stay there for fifteen hundred dollars a night. It's on the central coast. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. sick. I um, thought was a house was in San Fran. No. no. no the things, that's a good location scout, man. That's yeah. like a, 
getting a good crew together because like some of those locations really clever and there's a lot of like sort of back streets in sydney um through like the the dining scene with the sister which is so hardcore um that i think are done really cleverly and that know, movie was good that movie i really love really it. good that's my yeah. favorite film franchise is the universal movie monsters is number one fast and furious number two um and anytime universal sort of like get to play in that feel i get really excited it is frustrating in a wee way because every time they have something good, like Invisible Man, for instance, um, and the Brendan Fraser Mummy movies, even Van Helsing, like they made a shit ton of money. Uh, there's not necessarily a continuation. Whereas like back in the day, like, you know, Wolfman's 1942, Boris Karloff's Mummy, like Dracula, Bell with Bella Lugosi, all of those films, the characters tied in together together like there were still films that stood alone but then the actors would appear together in films yeah. and like bride of frankenstein you get boris karloff back and with elsa lancaster and it's so cool whereas now it's like we get a few good films from universal and the universal yeah. movie monsters and then it dips away yeah. and then you get another few good and then you get a, and like the renfield one that's coming up with nick cage and yeah. nicholas holt uh, i think what's called is gonna come um back mummy and I think Brendan Fraser is like, it's, he's in the pivotal point right now okay. to come back. So now that we really quick, we brief yarn, but I really loved that Tom Cruise 2016. No, it movie. wasn't bad. I no, liked it, it a lot. It, it, Some really good horror in there. Um, and the Book of the Dead from the Brendan Fraser mummy movie is in that film. So they're technically like, they're interconnecting the story. Like yeah. once it gets to the bit where Russell Crowe is like, oh, I'm fucking Dr. Jekyll. There's like all these little artifacts from different parts of the universe. Anyway, so I interviewed Tom Cruise for that and was doing like was a bunch of like sort of auxiliary interviews about that and ended up getting hired on that franchise because they were looking at doing essentially like what they did with Bumblebee. Bumblebee came from a Transformers writer's room. Yeah. And so they were looking at doing that for the Monsterverse, Monster Universal movies. And um, so I got hired on it. I was like, oh my God, my dream project. <laughs> like, holy shit. So negotiations, uh, negotiations, whatever. They're sending through a contract and be like, would you do this for $5? And I'd like, I'd do it for free, but whatever. <laughs> That the negotiations start on like a Wednesday. The film comes out on a Thursday. It's the butt of internet jokes by a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, an amazing three days on Twitter, but people are just absolutely shredding it. It flops by Monday. The whole franchise is dead. Yeah, goodbye. Goodbye. goodbye saw, to the dream. I, I saw, I saw that. It's like, it's like, Hey, <laughs> monsterverse is, is here. Next the dark week, universe is what it was called. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, Oh my God. I would, I would get them coffees to work on that. And it was like, yeah, it's going to happen. I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And then I, I actually, literally in four days. I actually don't it's think done. it's dead. I think they'll try to bring it. They keep trying to bring it back and they will bring it back again. Yeah. I think you just have to really commit to the bit. Cause yeah. I think Invisible Man was the perfect starting point. I was yeah. like, there was a uh, Lee Winnell who did Invisible Man, uh, who also did Saw with James Wan. Uh, he was supposed to be doing a Wolfman movie that Blumhouse were also doing with Ryan Gosling. And it was sort of described as the howling meets, um, meets broadcast news, I think, which I, I like as a vibe is interesting and unique and specific. And that was supposed to be years ago. And mm. so I'm not sure what's happening with that, if that's still going on, but yeah, it's just like whoever is in charge of it, you just really have to commit. Cause I think that's also the thing, like you watch it happen with Marvel People always talk about Marvel and the lens of right now of them being this giant, but like, what was the first Marvel movie? Iron Man. It was an, a hit, but it wasn't like a colossal hit. It wasn't like the dark Knight. And what was their second incredible Hulk, which was yeah. a flop. Like yeah. people didn't like it. I actually quite liked it. I don't really like Ed Norton, but like, yeah, it's enjoyable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it's, people always think about it at the end of the day of like, they just look at it as this big, like conglomerate success. And it's like, sure now maybe but you have to take risks and you also Honestly, have to take yeah. hits you hits yeah. and misses that's yeah it. that's how it is but you really do have to commit to the bed it's like this will pay off in the end but there's a problem like with being consistently hit after hit mm. the problem with this generation especially these times mm. if marvel were to release four flops in a row mm. no one will forgive it like yeah. you it's like that's it. They're over. I remember that. And that's that, what this industry is now. Like you, you is, fuck up yeah. twice. Unfortunately. And that's it. It's like, I remember people saying that with like both Shang-Chi and Black Widow and maybe like, what are people watching? Both are good. Both these are, good. are honest I to God, them, are like two of my favorite MCU. Yeah. I was like, these are amazing. 
genuinely amazing. I couldn't understand, but this is also a little bit of a problem with the wider pop culture discourse at the moment is that it feels like there is no nuance anymore. There's no room or capacity for conversational complexity. It's either something's the greatest thing to ever great or it sucks and it, it sucks so I think, hard. I think, I think the problem is with Infinity War and, and Endgame. They, mm. they were like the climax of the whole genre. Mm. That's I find that a problem because if you have like segment and there's like for each phase, there's a mm. huge epic climax the thing is you have to come back strong with the next one yeah yeah it can't be so much less than what the the thing that came out was like Mm. infinity war now here's the thing what i worry about is how they're going to do um the kang dynasty Mm. and how they're going to do um um secret wars Mm. if they if these things don't like overshadow infinity war and and um Infinity War and Endgame, there's going to be like a huge problem. Yeah, well, it's, it's also like there's dips dips and crests, right? You got to look at it like waves, you know, there are things up and things are down yeah. and like stories can be big and epic, but it's also, unfortunately, it's like this is the monster you built is that everybody wants an epic event or an epic yeah, crossover the, the, or they whatever. Need, they need a bit, they, like I've heard it time and time again, whenever something gets released, mm. they need it to be as good as, as Infinity War. Mm. I just, you know what? It's not fair. I, I didn't love Endgame, you know? So for me, Infinity I Infinity War was better than Endgame. Uh, yeah. Inf- I liked Endgame, Infinity but Infinity War was better. I think there should have been one movie. But, so, so that's but there was, there were, but like two hours and a half. I no, 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 not combine them. Oh, like, like, as in like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Like I, I, I say this for Matrix yeah. 2 and 3 that you haven't watched uh, either. Yeah, yeah. That should have been one movie. So crazy to me. That's so disrespectful to Australian culture. I've they seen the Fast and Furious saga. Does that make either. you feel better? They haven't watched Matrix. Wait, right? wait. You haven't seen The Matrix? No, no. They haven't seen any of The Matrix. You haven't seen Fast and Furious? I have seen it. That's okay. Of course they've seen that. All right, that's okay. That, that's <laughs> all right. Is that really your second favorite saga? Yeah. Fuck yeah. Are really? you kidding? Oh my God. Like, here, okay. I find that so interesting. I, first of all, I love cars, but I also like love diversity <laughs> as a wacky concept. But Fast and Furious was really the franchise that proved to Hollywood that diversity is a fruitful business model because first fast and furious movie it's based on this feature article called racer x which is a banger you can read it for free online and it was looking at latin and asian car racing culture in new york specifically and so that gets adapted into the film but it's mainly like representing latin culture and african-american culture and the asian characters get positioned as the villains which isn't great then you push into the second film and Devin Aoki's character, Zuki, becomes a bit yeah. of a bigger part. Yeah. You start expanding the aperture and they're bringing in more characters of different yeah. ethnicities. And the third one is all set in Tokyo and Tokyo Drift. And, you know, it's not the best of the franchise, but there's lots of important bits in that film that yeah. then... I disagree. Part three is top tier. Is I it? Love, <laughs> I, love, I love part three. I You're like, a big Lucas yeah. Black guy? Too Fast, Too I'm Furious a, is I'm my favourite. I'm a big I love Japanese it. car yes. guy and it's like, that was all Japanese yeah, was all Jap cars, yeah. was the, main, the main dude is like probably the worst guy in, in it like yeah. I, he, he's not too bad but it's like i, I just found him with yeah. I'll, I'll continue about it after you finish your list <laughs> yeah i actually i have a theory that it would have worked better if it was like um like a, a female cousin of dom or something like that. it would have worked way better if that girl that's the main in that i've got i forgot her name but if she was the main that mm. aussie chick yeah 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 if she was the main i would have liked the whole movie more yeah I still want Devin Aoki back. Like, where's was justice for Suki? Like, everyone was talking about, it's like, where do we get that? But anyway, each film, they keep expanding different ethnicities in the film and in the cast, getting to do different stuff. And the groups that are coming out to see the film, because they're getting to see a version of themselves represented in a blockbuster, in many cases for the first time, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's a big part to do with why that franchise gets financially more and more successful. And it's, it creates this template of like, if you build it, they will come. If you cater to people, they will come. And like the female characters in Fast and Furious fucking rip. Yeah, like true. there's always something fun to do. Even when they're villains, like Charlie's is the unblinking villain. <laughs> it's just like really fun with the, like the very terrible dreadlocks. I'm like, fun, camp, fun. Helen Mirren, camp and fun. Like, I still have the question when she was in the prison cell, the glass The cell. glass, how, how did she how pee? Did, how not did only, she pee? Not, not only that, she kept changing her clothing. Yeah. Like no. she had all these like designer clothing kept changing. As somebody like, with is she a, a very... prisoner? 
she was not a prisoner. As someone with a very small bladder, I was like, how is she peeing? Do they all watch her pee? Like, how does this work? What is happening when it's that time of the month? Who was bringing her tampons? Like, what is the process for this situation? I get it. It's a glass cage. It looks cool, whatever. But I just need like a small, like Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs, a film you haven't seen. He has a toilet in the corner of his little fucking glass cage. I feel like I'm getting attacked every time you do one of those. Well, it's film because you haven't watched film anything. Has, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. Are you excited is, for honestly. Fast X? Yeah, I'm so yeah. excited. I'm so excited. Yeah. I love Tubbs and Shaw. So I w- Tubbs and Shaw's good. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're calling that. Who, who do you think Brie Larson's character is? Is she, is she a cousin, a sister? Is that no, confirmed? No, no. I don't. Or she, I, she might be a relative to Brian. That's kind of the only I made thing the that jo- makes sense. I made the joke that she's Brian's sister, like a long time ago. I made that online. It's like this yeah. is Brian's sister, and that's and not if impossible. That happens, I want credit. <laughs> <laughs> that's not impossible to shoehorn in Honestly. Brian's sister, but it's like. Yeah, that would also be like be a wee bit tough because it's like you've never come up before, but that's you know it is what it is. Um, but he hasn't been such a big that's, part that's, of the films recently, so yeah. I think you said that hasn't came up before. But there's a lot of things that haven't came up before. Like Vin Diesel went having from a like brother criminal to having a brother that's that. Then he has a grandma or mother that's like super CIA. I don't know what's happening anymore. Oh man, I'm so into it. I love it so hard. The story I truly... lines are strange. Though. It's just the, the evolution, the evolution from part I'm one in. to part X is just amazing. But the storyline is rob, so strange. They rob trucks and now they rob satellites. You now <laughs> they're superheroes, Cody. Superhero. What have you got against superheroes, huh? Well, you know, wait, hold on. Just by watching, <laughs> by watching the trailer, yeah. is Jason Momoa's character really out for vengeance because he got knocked off a bridge? Okay, so I don't watch trailers, so I wouldn't know. Oh, so, so basically, yeah. well, I'm too, there's too much stuff in it. Like, okay, okay. I stopped in Can we talk it. about the trailer? Can we talk about the trailer? Yeah, yeah. Why not so, talk about it? So basically, we, I see, love Jason we, Momoa, see, we so. see a scene where he, like, they take out the... The, the safe, right? The safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Safe. One and of my favourites. And they the knock franchise. a dude off a bike, uh, uh, you know. <laughs> but isn't it his safe? Isn't it, that's what I heard on the streets? Is that uh, of the streets of I Tokyo? Think so. That he's the owner of the safe. They hopefully, robbed him. Hopefully, if they, if they robbed him, that will make more sense. Yeah. Because if they just knocked him off the bridge, <laughs> and that's his vengeance that's story. Awesome. In the trailer, they made it seem that the safe hit a car, and the car fell off the bridge, and then that's his revenge. That's what that's what the that's, that's what like. I'm saying. The story can be kind of strange sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I like the cast. I like the cars or whatever. But the story like can a, be sometimes like a bit. Icky. That's like uh, that's almost at the status. I don't know if you watch Dragon Ball Z. I dip in and dip out. Okay, I find so, all so, the yelling so really stressful. A char- <laughs> there's a character named Broly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In Dragon Ball Z, and his storyline, the reason he hates Goku so much, or well, the original storyline, is because ba- um, baby Goku used to cry loud. Yeah, I mean, and he built that's pretty fucking annoying, he built, honestly. He built, like, that's he built, fair, he valid. Relatable. He, he, he became the legendary Super Saiyan with all this anger yeah. because of crying baby. Yeah, well. <laughs> respect. That's, yeah. Like, that's like a that's Fast and Furious story right there. But you know, like, honestly, trying to come up with a good villain, like we were talking about honestly, Magneto yeah, before and how yeah. much you love Magneto. It's so hard. It is, it is. Like, yeah. there's this Tolkien quote about the, you know, a villain should think they're the hero of their own stories, which is such a great, like, one-liner. But also, coming up with a, a villain has to also mirror your protagonist yeah. and be reflective of, like, whatever your story is and, and whatever the family. themes and tones are. Yeah, yeah like, it, that's really tough. And that's why I think, um, what's his fuck uh, with the bald head? Uh, Jason, uh, no, not Jason, you know, Jason, Jason Statham. Okay. So that's why I feel like Jason Statham wasn't a great Fast and Furious villain and makes a better Fast and Furious team member slash protagonist is because the team's whole thing was about family and his whole thing was about family. And I was like, well, shit, they actually care about the same stuff. Of course, it's going to loop all the way around. Well, here's the problem with Fast and Furious though. Every villain I don't becomes, like that statement. I don't like that statement no, 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 at no, all. No, no, listen, you listen, because you, you, I stand by it, and you know it's true. Every villain, yeah. like, basically becomes a friend. Every single one. Yeah. Everyone. Well, this John is the last. He loves it clearly. This is a fuck yeah. Okay, okay, and, I, I, and I'm gonna bring you back on the show if Jason Momoa. Everyone ends up, has a that, pass, one, one Cody. Second, one second. If Jason Momoa ends up being their friend, he can't. He can't. It's the last one. No, it's not. 
Yeah, isn't no, this no, no, like no. the end no, no. of the saga? No, no, this is where the road begins to end. <laughs> oh, I did see that. That really pissed me off. I thought one last ride would have been a better... Because it's not the last ride. Saying that for no, like seven no, of them, there's, X, there's 11. Yeah. 11 is the last apparent one. But then, and then there'll be spin-offs. No, there is spin-offs. Yeah, they confirmed guess, the all-girl cast one. Yeah, but they've been talking about that forever. Oh, I remember do- when they were doing an all-girls expendable. And I'm like... What's up with female family? Yeah, bet. <laughs> like, let us have it. Give me, like, the matriarchal Fast and Furious. Let's go. Yeah. What's your the one? old Volvani and Fury Road. They were fucking that, smashing it. Don't Give me the old but bitches from ima- Fury oh, Road. Can, can you just imagine they make a spin off and Suki's not in it? Can you imagine? I would be storming the offices. Yeah, I need you to day like, one. call Suki's out. Suki's underrated, honestly. Day, oh, <laughs> she's I, very I feel like she's properly rated. Like, because there's a real cult fandom for her. I got a few Suki shirts in my wardrobe. Like, and anytime I wear them, people are like, I fucking love her. Fucking, she's so sick. No one wears the Ja Rule shirt, though. It's like Ja Rule character. Monica! Yeah. He's the best character. <laughs> I even made a movie poster about just his character oh coming God. back. Because that's a revenge story right there. Monica. That's it. Monica! <laughs> yeah, that's it. What is it? So, um, Suki drives a Honda S200 from S2000. So oh, yeah. isn't that it? That one is so beautiful. Yeah, the yeah. I love her car. So, oh, my God. That'd be, that's like, I prefer older cars, like a Australian or American muscle. Yeah. Like, a, I mentioned the V-Dub Beetle, but like a 1974 pink Tirana would be like one of mine. One of my dream cars, but oh, I, I wouldn't say no to that Honda. That is a good car. But what's called, his, who's, who else was introduced in that movie? Ludic- and Ludacris's character. Tyrese right? as well. Tyrese. That's no, where, Tyrese was, oh, that was no, part two. No, yeah, that, that was, was part two. That, yeah, 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 he's introduced yeah, in that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and also I think so. That movie's directed by John Singleton, R.I.P. What a king! But one of the best directed of the franchise. Like truly, just it has something. Like there's something in that movie. Like so much of is that what... one your favorite? Too, too fast. <sighs> that was the one with Eva Mendes, right? Yeah, yeah and he does the stare. Does she like? Do you do the stare and drive? I told she's him a, that. Why didn't pretty, she ever yeah. come back? She did. She did. She did. She did. Wait, yeah, she pop. has a scene with the Rock later. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's at the end of six or seven i can't remember which one but um she comes back briefly i wouldn't be surprised if she's back for these next two i love the second for all the things that it sets up i love fast five um i love uh hobson shore is i i cried in the cinema when they go to samoa i was like oh my god this is so important for the culture (laughs) really think that movie is excellent and then i loved um fate of the furious that was the one that i think is like really really underrated i thought that was really good i didn't love fast nine but i also had a bad viewing experience i got into a fight with these people behind me who at, at the end, turned out to be 12-year-old boys. I didn't know that at the time because I was telling them, shut the fuck up because they um, every time John Cena would come on screen, yeah. they would play, it's John Cena. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, ha, ha, ha. Very funny. For once, one, maybe twice, the whole – they kept doing it yeah, every single annoying. time and it was like – this was right in between lockdowns, so it was like you very – you had few opportunities to see something at the cinema – and I was in post-production on this audio doco at the time. So I was like doing that, recording it at Nova next door. And then like had dashed over, desperate to see the Fast and Furious movie. I'll do anything. See it by myself. I don't care. Love going to the movies by myself. And these little kids were fucking playing the goddamn John Cena meme. And so I turned around. I was like, will you shut the fuck up? We've all paid like 28 bucks to be here. Yeah. Just want to watch the film. And they're like, tee hee hee. Anyway, so they stopped it for a bit. <laughs> And they kept doing it again. I was like, I'm going to lose my mind. So anyway, I got into a yelling match with these people who I thought were people. And then the lights came up. It was like a row of 12-year-old boys. Oh, and I was man. like, oh, okay, I'm an asshole, I guess. But no, also, they deserved them. their dad was there. No, and I was just go. like, step in, bro. No, no, this is ridiculous. They deserved that. No. We had a cinema full of people. Good Every single up. one was uh, like pissed off at these kids. I respect you. But that was up. like, welcome to my life of two hours. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's my choice not to have yeah. fucking 12 year If I suffer, boys. you guys suffer. That's what it yeah. is. Yeah. Oh, man. The, I don't enjoy confrontation, but sometimes I really do thrive in it. Yeah. You need, no, they need to be put in their place. Sort of. Who cares? No, not a place for playing memes. We get it. Yeah. <laughs> honestly, it's not. No, hopefully, like we we we're doing some work on um, Fast X when it comes out. That's like, so exciting. Doing some posters and promotions for it. Hopefully, they do a world tour. Oh yeah, I would love for one of them to come. They on the usually do a pretty. They often do. Like I remember, and obviously not for Fast Nine because you know the pandemic was yeah. like left and right. 
But pretty much every time they've always had, because that's the benefit of having such a large cast yeah. is you can parcel people off and, yeah. you know, send four cast members to do the Asian tour, somebody else over to Australia, New Zealand, you know. I wonder who's going to come to Australia. Fingers crossed they come on here. Do we have any? Listening. Listening. Jason Podcast. Momoa loves Australia. He'll probably come. Oh. Yeah, that would be sick. Because mm. I, I have to actually pitch that into the people I'm working with. Like, we're pitching in the, like, the podcast every time we do mm. something, like a block Oh, I guess. Yeah. So <gasps> if we can get like Jason Momoa come to my house, that would be like dope. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. But that's like pop culture conventions, yeah. isn't it? You go on tour for, especially in Australia, because you tour with people, the same group of guests for like a pocket of two weeks. So you do end up becoming friends with people in a quite like natural and organic way. I always find that weird. Like when they invite me to like a con mm. and they invite me to the back room where all the celebrities mm. are, it's like, hey, do you know this guy? This guy's this guy. Like they introduced yeah. me to them. Yeah. And I'm like, how the fuck are they supposed to know who I am? I don't know. It's like, I just never, I never ask. I never yeah, let I, people I, I, know I, that I know. I'm just like, listen, I'm here for some sliders and a little side salad mm. and I'll sit in my corner then and you someone got, comes over and starts to I don't want to mention any names, but there's always that like one celebrity that knows he's a celebrity. Like, oh yeah, don't touch me. This, oh, is, my, this is my aura. We know, yeah, those we know are the people. Like, they're like the top tier assholes. <laughs> yeah. It's always if you're wearing sunglasses inside. That's yeah. usually the big yeah. red flag. <laughs> don't, don't look at me. Don't that's, look at me. Yeah. I'm too famous for you. <laughs> that's, that's how it is, man. I, that's why I stopped going into those back rooms, man. It's like, I don't, I don't want to join. I get really hungry. So I always go back because I want a snack. Oh, <laughs> that's the only place they feed you. So I'm like, let me just go in and get some couscous and then bounce. Um, you've been mentioning a lot about like empowering your cast mm. and diversity and stuff. Mm. And I feel like in this industry, that's really important. Mm. Uh, you and Code always push, or at least from what it seems like to me, you always push uh, for helping those around you and bringing them up because you guys came from really mm. hard times, right? It wasn't always easy. <laughs> and I feel like, honestly, you are very inspirational in your field. It's true. You are very, it's very yeah. nice and I want to die. this is my this is my my answer to everything but i don't say it (laughs) it's like i don't know how to take compliments it's like someone's saying giving compliments i'm like (sighs) yeah thanks i I just like i always uh know that people also like listening and it's important for them to understand it wasn't easy and like Uh. you said you guys you both have the mentality of this is all i have this is i'm going to give up my all Uh. honestly and you stick to it and that's like, like I said, it's very inspiring. And has it, was it always like that for you? Or did it, was it just something came, like it came to a certain point where you're like, nah, I, I have to either go all in or just mm. sink or swim. Basically. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've always had to work multiple jobs at once. And so I think that's, that's like part of the, like the balancing act is just like, damn, if this book thing doesn't work out. Or like people think you make so much money off books. I'm just like, no, you don't. <laughs> Maybe if you're John Grisham and shit, but like, oh, you know, outside of that, yeah. it's it's a grind. They say the average author in Australia makes eight grand a year. Who can live off eight grand a year? Like no, that's insane, no, right? Good, yeah. So yeah, even when I had the books, I was still like, I, you know, I started as a journal out of high school and was working as a journal, but I was also still competing in surf events for extra money. And then eventually gave that up to like, I realized writing was actually my passion and surf was just something you did because you were geographically around it. But it was something that the culture was really tough. It was like a lot of people that we came up with either went to jail, died, or are still sort of like tangentially in it in some capacity. Very few people make it and the stakes are so high for those who do make it. And so moved into shifting on writing, but I still was like, was enough money. So I was still doing freelance entertainment journalism and writing for places like Bloody Disgusting and Empire Magazine, and then was working for a different, stepped up to a different newspaper. So you're making a little bit more money, but yeah. still having to do book stuff on the side and like push the book hustle and getting a book published is so fucking hard. And it was just like, I remember putting um, my first book, Who's Afraid, out on submission and I got signed by an agent. I was like, ooh this is so crazy I got signed. like I have someone who like you know my people call your people like I only had one person but you could yeah, <laughs> say yeah. that like a wanker but I remember getting this rejection letter from a publisher and them saying to me and this was just post twilight so 
this was the era of like the young adult urban fantasy genre was sort of at its peak. So everyone wanted a love triangle and shit like that. And so I remember them coming back to me and being like, um, we don't understand why this character would be searching for her father. And also we would like if you could add a love triangle, make the character white and make her 16. Jesus. And I just remember, like, mm. this was in writing, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, from a top publisher, and I was like, I'm going to keep this letter forever and really remember this. And I still, like, there was a, a head of a network here who told me to my face that Pacifica stories weren't diverse enough for their network. And I was just like, bet, I'm going to remember that forever. Like, I will remember that, like, you know, it's just, it's not that, like, it, it like, fuels your fire or whatever, but it's just, like, sometimes the only way you can sh- get people to shut yeah. the fuck up <laughs> yeah. is to be really successful and prove them wrong in yeah. any capacity. True. Right. And so was working in the newspaper doing book stuff at the same time and then got a job working on this nightly news show called the feed at SBS, which was, um, it doesn't exist anymore, but it was like five nights a week. And it's like, we're making television and everybody on the crew was young and diverse and hungry and, in media, it had always been this thing of like, there would very rarely ever be anybody who wasn't like a straight white guy or like a straight white woman over a certain age. Mm. And so suddenly I was working on the show with everybody who'd always felt othered in that environment. And the kind of stories that we were doing was shit that I really cared about. Okay, yes, it was stuff like, why is there always boobs built into pop culture armor? <laughs> so like dumb. Yeah. But then it was always stuff about, you know, like young stroke survivors and covering world events. And mm. I got to make a thing about the making of Moana and go over to LA and like interview the team there and just like also cover the US election and just do a bunch of different stuff. And like they really encouraged you to try and learn skills that you didn't have, which was, you know, writing was always my strength, but they're like, okay, you're going to learn how to produce and you're going to learn how to line edit and you're going to learn how to do this. And like, we need somebody to be a background actress for this and I can't act for shit, but like, that's just tough. You're on a budget and you just have to figure that sort of stuff out. And I will say like that idea of like start from humble beginnings, like it's still not easy. Like I had Mm -hmm. a moment a few months ago where it's like, I'm applying for a job at Coles and I got rejected. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but like it, that's seriously, it's just like you, people yeah. look at your success and they think, oh shit, she has awards or 11 books and it's, you know, done whatever these TV shows and has like things in the market or whatever. And they think and perceive that as being so successful, but also it was at the point where it was so dire after a year of like fucking getting my body fucked up with lots of breaks and yeah. having to take time off and stuff that I was like, I am so broke and so desperate that I'm going to have to apply for a job at Coles that I didn't get. And then thank fuck, I booked a show like two weeks later and that show like, you know, saved my life. But that show was also from a diverse creator who got given a shot by a different diverse creator and put that person on and that person on. And it's an Antarctic horror show, which is like, something I couldn't be more suited for. And the yeah. team is one people of the greatest. Yeah. yeah. The team is one of the greatest teams of people I've ever worked with. Who've all sort of like had these fascinating experiences and bring different skill sets to the table. And I think that's the other thing that I love about the job and like getting to tell stories is particularly like in a, in a space like that where you're working with others is you can't be everything. You can't be all things to everybody. It's just impossible. Of course, yeah. You turn yourself into a pretzel trying to make that <laughs> yeah, happen, right? Sure. But working in a team environment, my weaknesses are somebody else's strength and their weaknesses are my strength. And we complement ideally and benefit each other to hopefully come up with a story and to be able yeah. to craft a show where all of the best parts of our skill set are on display and hopefully make something that people engage with. Now, will that be good? Who could say? Art's fucking subjective. Like Mm. for every 10 people who like it, there's probably another 10 that hate it. But as long as like you believe it and you can stand behind it and dot, 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 you get paid to do it because I just like, I don't have the capacity to work on anything for free anymore. Yeah, that's fair. I think to answer your question as well. She mentioned it before. It's like, she got a chance by someone that got a chance Mm. and she would give the chance to someone that she feels that is worthy of it because she knows the struggle she knows how hard it is to get into the industry and if like for me 
especially like if I can help someone take that step or, you know, put them through the door because mm. I know they can do it. I'm lucky enough to be in there. I would bring them in as well because I know they can do it. And you know those moments where it's happened to you. Yeah. Like it, you really – like there's this artist who I love, credible Māori artist. You can look up uh, her up on Insta, Zessi, Z-E-S-S-I-E. Her name's Jess Hoiha. And um, I she had reached – her and her sister had reached out to me years ago because they were a fan of the books. And one of the main characters in my book is a Māori woman. Um, who's a werewolf. And so it's like dealing with themes of like the feminine grotesque and rage and all of the books in my series are like different classic monster and then sort of subverting that in different ways. So it's like the Banshee character in The Wailing Woman, a book that's dedicated to Mariah Carey, by the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that's all about like trying to find your voice and then learning what to do with it once you find it, right? Yeah. What better vessel to do that through than a fucking Banshee whose superpower is all about, you know, vocal stuff, right? But she'd reached out as a fan of my books uh, years ago and I was like, oh man, that was a cool interaction we had and we're just like chatting in the DMs and I started following her on Insta and her sister's and just had a great vibe and great energy. And I saw it uh, when the pandemic was happening that she was doing art and started doing more and more art. And I was like, fuck, she's so talented. Like she's genuinely so good, a really great digital artist. And I was like, hey, can I hire you on some stuff? Like, I know that's kind of weird. Like, I don't know if you do commissions or whatever. And so for my past three books, she'd done all original art um, that we put out as like an Instagram campaign. And like, that stuff, the publishers don't pay for that. Like, there's something you do out of your own pocket. Mm. The marketing spend on books is basically non-existent, mm. right? So it's like you really, if you want people to see it uh, or you at least want to be able to promote it in a way that you feel reflects the story and reflects the characters, you have to be able to pay for it. And that's not possible for everyone. Um, but in this particular instance, it was just like going to hire her to do some art. And there's been really another really great artist called Sam Chen, who is an assistant um, at one of the pop culture conventions that I'd been at and he had done some fan art of a character and I thought that was amazing and I was like can I hire you to do some art and it's just like you don't know where those opportunities are going to come from but there's a saying I actually heard the rock <laughs> sounds so lame but you know fuck it he's Pacifica and there's some Pacifica values that connect across the board but he had this saying that it's like you ain't shit if you didn't bring people with you. Sure. You know what I mean? For like sure. you're you're worth something independently, but like if you didn't bring others with you, like what does it matter? Sure. You know? And I kind of always think about that. I think of all the times people have given me opportunities or stuck their neck out for me. And it seems sometimes can seem like nothing to somebody, but that little inch you get builds up and builds sure. up and, and so, builds so, up. Someone said something like that resonates with that. It's like if you're going to go out into the ocean mm. and you're going to like sail, you don't take a jet ski. <laughs> yeah. As in like you take a bigger <laughs> boat with bigger people and then yeah. you more people with you. That's, that's what you do. And it's like, and that's why I got these guys with us. Appreciate it. Bro. Yeah. And you guys yeah. roll deep. It's not yeah. a con if it's not like the boss posse. Yeah. The bossy? What? No. <laughs> it's too close to bussy. I don't think we can win <laughs> <run> with that. <laughs> but that girl went from being a fan to working with you, which is nice. Oh, yeah. yeah. Her art's amazing. She does works for, um, has done some incredible work for all these different K-pop bands and stuff. It's just. Isn't she glad she messaged you? Oh, um, yeah. But I mean. Her life messaging is. I feel like her art's incredible. Yeah. It would, it, like, you know, it wasn't me it was going to be somebody else um shout out zessi yeah fuck yeah all That's the cute. wahine um <laughs> she thumbs up. She thumbs she's up. a bmw let's call it bad mana wahine um but yeah there's just so many people like that's one of the really good things about social media um is that it can connect people and exactly. you can work from home as well people from all different parts of the world who felt like they never had opportunities and chances to work that's the good side of social media thank yeah. god yeah that's the good the beneficial truly side. Yeah. the amount of people who randomly will find my work or buy a book of mine or um watch a show that i've worked on because they th found me through instagram or like a meme drop on a monday or some shit is truly baffling and same thing it's just like you meet people at a at an event or whatever and you live in different countries and you follow them on instagram so and you don't even have to live in different countries we met each other at a con yeah we, we stayed in touch yeah but socials. different states and shit australia's yeah. a big country we stayed like, in touch on your twitter and, yeah and your weird ass memes that you <laughs> okay <laughs> we, okay <laughs> thank you for they're the support great. Great. I, I say yeah. weird ass, so but I, i've got it me and all my fan <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say they were bad. <laughs> I enjoyed them. Weird. You heard the implication, audience. <laughs>
Have a laugh, you miserable I bastard. Do, I do have a laugh. <laughs> I enjoy them. That's why I remember them. <laughs> no, but seriously, like, thanks so much for having me on the show. Like, I, when you guys said that um, you wanted to have me on from the beginning, I was like, <laughs> why? <laughs> yeah, that we, seems wild. We, we but- had to do a few test shows because we didn't know how good yeah, what if we're uh, good. Uh, yeah, if we're I, good honestly I feel yeah, like there hasn't sure. even been enough time to cover like everything we want to I've still got so many questions but that's questions, why there's a part two exactly like so part yeah, two. there'll always be in the future but for now she has to like you, you've told us your dream jobs that you got mm. you, you told us your passion project which mm. you just did mm. directed um what do you want to tell the people what's your next step and yeah. where do they find you and you know so Keep you can in touch with you. buy Marvel's Mockingbird Strike Out in June. It's now available for pre-order. You can get that everywhere. It comes out all over the world at the same time. Uh, I have another book coming out in October called The Graveyard Shift, which is a slasher. So if you like horror, you do. Yeah. You are you yeah, okay, yeah. cause like do we? Oh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. I like my horrors. Yeah. yeah, it's a slasher that's set in Melbourne um, about a woman who hosts a horror horror radio show. And somebody calls into a show on Halloween that she thinks is a prank and they've actually been killed on air. And so it's this race Oof. against time to sort of figure out who the killer is and what they have to do with films because all the murders are happening at key movie locations in and around Melbourne. Oh, interesting concept. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. A- it's a very like, you know, wink to the things I love, yeah. like Scream, which is um, relevant to an upcoming blackout you have, right? Yeah. How's that? Next a little week. bit of seamless cross promo. Next week. Yeah. Yeah. Seamless cross promo. <laughs> Natural. Can, yeah. It. Yeah. That's it. Um, and you can find me on Instagram uh, and Twitter just as Maria Lewis. You'll, you you'll find me. You'll These are her books, it. by the way. They're not just yeah. there for fun. Yeah. <laughs> novels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll, make, we'll make a post and yeah. we'll tag her. And also when we get, when the Mockingbird comes out, we'll get it and we'll get you to sign one and we'll give oh, it away on yeah. the show. Mate, oh. Whatever you, literally whatever you need. I will, can I just say one thing before we go? But I remember one of these books, I don't know if you remember this because like you've lived a life, but it came from the deep, which was a book that I was self-publishing because everybody told me that nobody wanted Merman or Aqua shit. And this was just as Aquaman was about to come out, Shape of Water, Tideland, Siren, the show. Anyway, uh, you did this piece of artwork for me that I feel like you did for free. Like, I don't even think I did. Oh, like I don't even think I paid you for it. I, I, was, did, I didn't want to charge you. Yeah. <laughs> there was this super amazing piece of a merman and it was so sick and it's like still one of the best pieces of artwork to this day. And I swear to God, the first few thousands of copies of that book that I moved, I reckon were from that piece of artwork being yeah, so I had sick. a lot of people at cons come to me. It's like, you did this. I'm like, yeah. She's like, <laughs> Maria says you did this. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, that's right. yeah. I'm <laughs> like, go to booth. And one, you said two, that seven. I didn't remember. I, I didn't. I tell you specifically. I made a cover for her. Yes, yeah, he yeah. Told me, but yeah. It was so sick. Like honestly, I'll never forget it. Like I truly, I was just like, that's a real one. And this was years, years and years ago. Like you know. Anyway, this is before Aquaman. And if you look at the cover, it looks like Aquaman. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it does. Mamos. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh man. Cute. Yeah, shout outs to Momoa and yeah, we'll leave it at that. Thank you for so, coming on the thank show. You for Thanks for having me. Thanks for letting me tease honestly. you both relentlessly <laughs> uh, for I two get, hours. I get that every week. It's <laughs> Watch a movie. I didn't, I didn't, I'm used to it. I'm going to say Little D once till now. Oh, uh, uh, there you go. That, <laughs> till now. That counts. Oh, <laughs> right. poor Little D. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thanks for joining us. Love you guys. Shady, next thank you for operating. Thank and good questions. Asking us all these good questions. questions. Good questions. King Shady, bro. He's, he's never like loved enough. We yeah, love him. No, we do love <laughs> yeah. him. We do <laughs> love him. Yeah. He's got a mic now. Yeah, That's yeah, really yeah. stepped up. There you yeah. go. <laughs> Hopefully soon he'll start joining us. He's going to get an overhead <gasps> camera soon. So yeah, fingers yeah. crossed. Get him a little chase lounge. Yeah. Draw him like one of your French girls. Yeah, uh, done. He deserves it. Peace out. Love you guys. Thank you.